for two more minutes and then yeah. we will start okay Good afternoon, one and all. Welcome to the second keynote session of ICACC 2021. The speaker for the session is Dr. Dong Hwan Park, Chief Researcher, Youngbuk Hybrid Technology Institute, South Korea, who will be giving a talk on the topic, Fourth Industrial Revolution and Smart Processing Technology. He received his bachelor's and master's in mechanical engineering and completed his PhD from Pusan National University, South Korea, in materials and manufacturing processes mechanical and precision engineering. He started his research career in LG Electronics, South Korea, and has worked in major reputed organizations and institutions like Renault Samsung Motors, Fosco Co Limited, and Queensland University of Technology, Australia. Currently, he resides as the chief researcher of Gyeongbuk Hybrid Technology Institute, South Korea, working on study of automotive hybrid parts and material technology. He has many publications in international journals, conferences, and symposiums to his credit. He has also published several books and received various research grants along with patents. He has also provided research guidance to many scholars. It's an honor to have an eminent person like him with us today. However, due to the current pandemic situation, he will be joining us via the Zoom platform. May I welcome Dr. Park for the second keynote session of the day. Uh, thank you, Dr. Niva. Yeah, how are you? Yeah, I am Dong Han Ba uh, in South Korea. Uh, I am happy to have uh, this presentation 
uh, for ICACC 2021 uh, conference. Thank you. My topic is uh, today post-industrial uh, revolution and smart processing technology. Uh, now I am working for Gengok Hybrid Technology Institute in Yongcheon City. Uh, you know, I think uh, near Daegu City in South Korea. And next, uh, uh, our co this content is a uh, post-industrial revolution. Uh, second, uh, paradigm shift in mold industry and advanced smart mold uh, technology. And finally, future economic mold manufacturing technology. Then I will explain uh, uh, this one. Then what is the post-industrial uh, revolution? I think uh, <laughs> now we are here, live in uh, our world. Uh, first, uh, uh, in industrial revolution, uh, you know, as you know, water power and uh, steam power uh, develop, uh, develop, invented. Uh. Then second, industrial revolution, mass production, assembly line, electricity. Yeah. And the third uh, industrial revolution, then we, uh, we use uh, computer and automation uh, recently. Now we are both uh, uh, industrial revolution era, the cyber physical systems. I think we are uh, use AI, artificial intelligence, uh, big data, and uh, hyper connectivity. And next, uh, the core technology of the post industrial revolution, uh, we have, uh, I divided the four uh, categories so material technology, digital technology, and biotechnology, human transformation technology. First, the uh, material technology, uh, we use the autonomous cars uh, uh, such as uh, Tesla or um, automobile car uh, maker, self-driving cars, drones, uh, uh, 3D printing, robot, AI, uh, et cetera. Digital technologies, IoT, Internet of Things, uh, uh, CPS, uh, blockchain, big data, uh, cloud computing. Biotechnology also, genetic te uh, technology, neuroscience, bioprinting, et cetera. And finally, human transformation technology, brain nova uh, technology, virtual augmented reality technology, and so on. Uh, then, core of the uh, post-industrial revolution. Yeah, we can, uh, you can see the, this part of industry 4.0 in German. Uh, autonomous robot uh, simulation uh, system integration, industrial uh, Internet of Things, cyber security, cloud computing, and uh, 3D printing, uh, additive manufacturing, uh, augmented reality, big data, and so on. Uh, now, convergence of technology and the industry real and the virtual connections through network connection. Yeah, recreation of new things through convergence between field. Uh, next, uh, what is the advantage of, uh, disadvantage of the uh, post uh, industrial revolution? I think advantages, uh, uh, many advantages we have uh, uh, improving productivity and uh, uh, quality in industry, improving quality of life and uh, reinforcement of uh, competitiveness um, and so on. But disadvantages, uh, changes in the employment structure due to the development of artificial intelligence, then uh, now we have some problems, mass unemployment. Uh, uh, 
and also network security problems uh, we have. Uh. Next, uh, uh, for example, uh, intelligence self-driving electric vehicles uh, introduced. Uh, we can see the this uh, Ford uh, car. Uh, now we uh, we can drive uh, autonomous cars. Uh, I think a uh, uh, level three uh, step. Yeah. Then intelligence model drive uh, modeling and autonomous driving, IoT and big data, uh, map data into working, and uh, electric vehicle. Eco friendly, uh, high efficient uh, battery also. But uh, we have some uh, responsibility, legal or illegal, and more moral issues. And the advanced driver assistance system, ADAS also. Our, our people uh, drive, can drive the car, but uh, we use ADAS uh, system. Who, who is the uh, responsibility? Uh, now we have uh, some problems. Uh. What's the problem? Uh, next, uh, paradigm shift in the motor industry. Uh, this, uh, my major is uh, sheet metal forming. Then uh, what is the uh, paradigm shift in the motor industry? Then uh, I chose the mold industry. Uh, CO2 emissions and energy consumptions. Uh, you can see the, this graph uh, uh, 2010, 2010 year, uh, USA, Korea, and Japan, China, Vietnam. You can see the, this uh, graph. And uh, CO2 emissions is high uh, in USA. But the uh, energy consumption also USA is very high. Yeah. Uh, where is the India? Yeah, China, uh, near China, I think. Uh, population growth rate and internet uh, subscribes. So, yeah, I think uh, population growth rate is, uh, uh, Vietnam is very high. Uh, now Japan, Japan or Korea is very low, I think. Uh, Internet is subscribers for 100 people. Uh, in uh, Korea, very high. High internet, uh, very high speed, and very so many people have uh, internet uh, using. Then paradigm shift in the mold industry. Uh, uh, now we have automation mold technology and the plus uh, fusion technology and the intelligence technology. Uh, we can see the, this uh, uh, photo, uh, transfer mold and the uh, drawing mold, uh, fine blanking mold. Uh, uh, so hybrid type, uh, fusion type, uh, fusion type uh, of uh, uh, mold, molding die. Yeah, we can see the, this molding die uh, line. Uh, finally, we can uh, get the uh, uh, final product uh, uh, output. Uh. Uh, the mold industry is changing from automate, automated mold technology to fusion technology and adding intelligence technology. Then now we completely amend the technologies uh, promoted. Yeah, no, well, as you know, uh, it is equipped with a sensor in the mold uh, uh, to inform you of a real time operation. And, uh, but the abnormality at any time you can see the, uh, uh, you can see the abnormality at any time. Mold industry in the uh, post industrial revolution. We can see the, this uh, uh, carbon fiber pass, car part, and the uh, car part with the uh, new lightweight materials. Uh, this material uh, applied uh, aluminum. 
Well, aluminum is very uh, lightweight uh, and lightweight part. Huh? And also new construction method and production method. We can see the uh, center filler parts in car. Uh, you can see, and the down is hot and cold uh, complex forging parts. Uh, we can make uh, this uh, hot and uh, cold uh, complex forging parts. And the amend automatic uh, machine. But this is a MCT a machining center. Yeah, can produce automatically amend the processing system. Uh, next. Then advanced smart mold technology. What is uh, the advanced mold technology? Uh, as uh, I said, uh, before I said, uh, uh, my major is sheet metal bombing, then uh, presser type uh, I uh, explained uh, and I experienced uh, this presser bombing. First, the uh, uh, press cutting, the hybrid, uh, range hybrid bunching, fine blanking, press technology. Uh, press bending is uh, a spring bank uh, technology. Press bombing is high. Hot press bombing, hydro bombing, magnesium alloy press bombing, aluminum alloy press bombing, and so on. Uh, we can use uh, uh, automobile parts, uh, electronic appliance parts, uh, as uh, this uh, uh, method, as uh, this method, using as using uh, this method. First, the uh, hot press bombing. We can see the, this uh, center pillar. Uh, center pillar means uh, B pillar. B pillar parts uh, in automobile, automotive. Uh, they are very high uh, strength. Uh, first step hitting uh, 880 to 950 degree. And the second step is hard press bombing. And the third step, catching between in dice. Uh, yeah, very, and we can get the uh, 2.5 time. Yeah, 1.5 uh, 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 gigapascal, uh, 150 kilogram pulse per millimeter scale. Yeah, we can get the, uh, uh, we can get uh, uh, more high strengths and uh, Applications of B-pillar or side shield, or beam, etc. Uh, we can see the, this uh, uh, car. Uh, this is a hot press bombing uh, pass. A case of application. Uh, this is center pillar. You can see the, this center pillar or rail. Loop rail and uh, panel body hinge. And on the red color, uh, you can see the hot stamped pass. Uh, we, uh, in our car, uh, car uh, applied this uh, part uh, by hot press bombing method. Uh, hot press bombing advantages. What is the advantages? Uh, advantages. Bombability also uh, uh, originally 60 kilogram pulse per millimeter scale, but now uh, about 1.5 gigapascal, so we can uh, get the uh, uh, press bombing pass. And the material deformation uh, during heat treatment, no deformation occurs. Uh, in the case of hot press bombing and welding. Also, uh, since uh, low carbon steel is uh, used as the base metal, weldability is, ability is uh, excellent. Yeah, product characteristics uh, of hot press bombing is uh, shows. Uh, we use the boron steel uh, in hot press bombing. Then uh, hot press bombing, 
uh, after the hopeless bombing, we can get the uh, yield strength is uh, 120 kilogram pulse per millimeter scale. Tensile strength is 150 uh, kilogram pulse per millimeter scale. 150, it means uh, uh, 1.5 gigapascal, very high strength. Yeah, physical properties of low, mat low material change from uh, 60 kilogram per, per millimeter scale to 150, to 150 uh, kilogram per, per millimeter uh, scale. Then very high, 2.5 times uh, high strength, higher strength uh, we can get. Second, hydrobombing. What is the hydrobombing? Yeah, uh, you can see that this uh, photo, uh, fiber and uh, outer dye, and uh, side, uh, uh, right left side, uh, you can press the air or oil, water. Yeah, hydrobombing technology is a process uh, uh, made into the tube shape. Yeah, you can get the uh, 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 tube, tube pass. Uh, because uh, hydrobombing press, hydro press act uh, evenly regardless of a uh, uh, shape complexity. It is possible to produce parts with the uniform thickness and the strength. Uh, this is a very uh, uh, big advantage. Uh, two types divided, uh, uh, hydrobombing, tubular hydrobombing and sheet hydrobombing. Uh, you can see that this uh, uh, photo. So the uh, 3D printing technology, yeah, raw material is solid ABS PP plastic material, powder, nylon, glass, and liquid. Uh, technology and principle and characteristic. Uh, this is a plastic material uh, we can use. But, uh, usually we can uh, use uh, 3D printing uh, at home. Yeah. But, I think material is a more uh, plastic material we use. But the powder metal, uh, two type, we divided two types of powder metal, uh, 3D printing. Uh, one is a uh, PDF, uh, powder bed, uh, bed fusion method, uh, and DED, direct energy deposition method, two type uh, we divide. Uh, we can see the 3D printer and uh, uh, 3D printing product and the metal, 3D printing metal product, uh, we can see. And uh, torso. Torso part of composition technology. Both of us uh, composition technology, press molding, yeah, this one. Uh, conventionally, we, uh, we make uh, uh, this one, press molding method. But now, uh, plastic material applications, because of a uh, right weight, uh, very low, uh, low right weight, uh, then plastic injection molding, right weight and function improvement. Uh, next, uh, powder sintered metal. Uh, you can see that this uh, uh, powder sintered metal, uh, but uh, it's very cost, uh, very high cost. Uh, but now, uh, bulging molding, cost reduction. Yeah, you can see the bulging product. Uh, uh, product, uh, we can make uh, uh, this bulging product uh, uh, many, uh, many products, mass production is uh, possible, but now uh, working process is, is very, very 
very many uh, working processes. But now, simply, we can get a budget multi product. A cost reduction is possible. Uh, second, a uh, uh, pass uh, conversion technology. Uh, we can see the uh, automobile car pass, local pass, uh, steel body such part. But now, aluminum material applications, yeah, uh, control, arm also, control arm also aluminum uh, materials, and uh, door also um, aluminum material, knuckle also uh, aluminum materials uh, applied. And, uh, and the uh, roof, car roof, uh, you can see the, this photo. Now CFRP material applications. Yeah, you can see the, this uh, uh, product. Uh, uh, we are have a, uh, we had a presentation now. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, sir. Yes, yeah, sir. Okay, so you have some questions? Yeah, some you have any questions? Hello. Thank you, Dr. Park, for the informative session on fourth industrial revolution and smart processing technologies. We have now yeah, come. Yeah. We have now come to the end of today's keynote session. We will now start with the technical sessions of the day. The technical session will be conducted parallelly in two venues, namely multimedia hall and Shunya lab. The session to be held in this hall will be chaired by Dr. Delisha M. Vishnathan mainly related to the data analytics and domain. The parallel session in the adjacent hall will be chaired by Dr. Nilish Shef, that will mainly related to VLSI and embedded system domains. I request all the participants to occupy their respective venues for their presentation. Help us teams outside this hall will give near assistance for all your queries. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, sir. You can leave now. Okay, thank you. Bye. Bye, sir. Good afternoon all.
respected session chairs, respected faculties, and dear participants, myself, Meenu Johnson, research scholar under Division of IT, SOE QSAC, under the guidance of research supervisors, Dr. Sandosh Kumar MP and Dr. Danya T, Associate Professors, SOE QSAC. I am here to do my presentation on the paper, a survey on deep learning architectures for effective crop data analytics. These are the contents of my presentation, introduction, motivation, methodology, research, discussion, conclusion, and the references. As an introduction, smart farming, that term is gaining much importance than ever before. According to United Nations, a 90% intensification of technological farming is required in order to adapt to the global climate change, natural disasters, and the, uh, growing, demand of, the dem growing demand of the population. So the term smart farming is, um, term, uh, is coined from the objective of re reorganizing the whole system of agriculture in order to minimize the environmental impact low input, uh, with the low input resources and uh, in order to uh, achieve sustainability in the farming and in order to enhance the farm productivity. The smart farming, this can be applied uh, for various domains of um, agriculture like weather forecasting, crop monitoring, livestock monitoring, uh, etc. The crop monitoring is much important uh, among all this because it is supporting the farmers very much. And here we focus on crop yield prediction and crop disease detection. The crop yield prediction is a crucial step in uh, smart farming because it involves the um, interaction between the complex environmental process, environmental parameters. And here, a reasonable estimation of the yield prediction is very important for the farmers in order to adapt to the global climate change, natural disasters, et cetera. And here, crop disease is a major reason for yield losses. So the early identification of the crop diseases and pest, uh, pest identification is important for the farmers in order to take nest and other agriculture extension officers to take necessary actions to, uh, in order to uh, avoid the impact over the final annual yield. Here, Initially, in earlier stages, if you, uh, uh, if you go through the literature, in the literature, we can see in the publications in the early stages, traditional methods were used for, uh, uh, for the farming, uh, like the intuition of the farmers, their experiences, the statistical analysis of the crop yield data, etc., were used for the yield prediction. But this cannot help the farmers anymore because of the uh, climate changes and the growing demand of the population. So recently, deep learning emerged as a important, um, important uh, tool in the crop data analytics. So here we focus on the survey on deep learning. So here we focus on the survey on uh, deep learning models for the crop yield prediction and deep learning models for the crop disease detection. So as we already said, the motivation or inspiration to do this survey is to help the rural farmers in developing countries who are um, facing uh, challenges such as a limited availability of the information of the environmental parameters, et cetera. And here uh, we can uh, see in the literature that many of the rural farmers in developing countries are um, frequently facing the outbreak of crop diseases. And also they are unaware of many of the recent diseases like the Fusarium TR4, which is affecting the banana crop, which is uh, able to wipe out the entire banana species from the planet. So here we try to help the researchers who are uh, in their effort to develop a deep learning model for the crop yield prediction and crop disease detection. So here, as for every survey, there are two parts, collection of the related birds, and second part is the analysis of the collected birds. And the methodology we have followed in this survey is shown in the flowchart. As you can see, first a review method is defined. In this, we have identified the objective of the review, and we have specified the research questions so these are the research questions formulated, FI research questions have been formulated. And uh, we have specified the search strings. These are the search strings we have um, specified in order to do the uh, survey. And we have defined the selection criteria. These are the selection criteria. We have included the um, related um, uh, publications in journals, then conference proceedings, book chapters, articles, and press also. We have excluded those publications before 2000, already retrieved publication and those in other languages and those uh, full test is not available. And we have conducted the review and we have selected the search databases to uh, collect the, uh, the related publications. 
And based on the retrieved data, we have redefined the uh, selection criteria and redefined the search string. And we have analyzed the retrieved data and we have concluded the results. So here, the results, we are uh, presented under two sessions, the deep learning based uh, crop preparation and deep learning based crop disease detection. So as you can see, we have started the um, uh, uh, literature survey from 2000 and uh, we have seen that the deep learning based um, contribution to the crop yield prediction came from uh, the year 2016 with the contribution of two scientists, Kuwata and Shabaski, they developed a deep neural network for the corn yield estimation. In the same year, another two scientists, Kim and Lee, they have compared this uh, deep learning model with other machine learning approaches like the random forest, SPM, et cetera. And in 2018, another major contribution with uh, Russell Lowe, they have uh, focused on how to develop a um, how to develop a deep learning model with the limited available availability of data. So, in order to uh, help the uh, rural farmers in developing countries where there is the data is scarce, so uh, they have developed a method to uh, help the uh, farmers to um, uh, develop the deep learning models in order to develop the deep learning models with the scarce data. And so they um, proposed a 3D CNN model for the yield estimation. Then in 2019, again, a CNN model was developed with the RGB and NDVI images as input. And a combination of CNN and LSTM model is again developed. We have seen the contribution in 2019, a DNN model is used. Then a spatial temporal multitask learning algorithm is um, experimented in which the, uh, this algorithm is working based on the assumption that the neighboring uh, regions will have the same yield values. And they have considered multiple sources of data like the temporal data, spatial data, climate data together into the um, yield prediction. And also we have seen another contributions are attention-based um, LSTM model. Then in, um, in the same year, we can see LSTM and neural network combination is also used for the yield prediction. When we come to 2020, LSTM is um, taking as a more popular model, a combination with the neural network model it is used. Then a deep crop net uh, model is proposed in which uh, it is a deep learning model, which is basically using LSTM for the um, analyzing of the Tamra features and multitask learning uh, model for analyzing the spatial features. Then um, for the uh, next two contributions are based on uh, RCCN, uh, region-based um, CNN, which is uh, uh, doing the crude counting and thus doing the yield mapping. Then uh, we can see again, deep neural network is used in which uh, climate data is uh, given more importance along with the satellite data. Then uh, Graeber is counting net as another contribution. Then uh, based on the publications we are subjected to study, we have plotted a graph and from this graph, we can see the major contribution started from 2016 and then there is a major increase. Uh, there's a tremendous increase in the contribution of the uh, deep learning models for the yield prediction. Then, um, so this uh, table answer the questions of research question three uh, in which, which are the evaluation metrics used for the comparison of the various machine learning models. So we can see in the uh, table that this RMC is um, most popularly used, popularly used by the researchers for the as a evaluation metrics. Then uh, table three will answer the research question one in which which are the deep learning models used for the um, uh, for developing the yield uh, prediction model in which the CNN is the most commonly used. Then uh, table four shows uh, which are the target crops used for the yield prediction study. Then table five answer the research question two in which um, uh, the uh, publication subject study is also listed along with the type of input data along with the prediction models used. And we can see in the table that the remote sensing data is um, commonly used in every prediction model. So it is considered to be a common um, input for the yield prediction model. When we come to the current year, we can see the uh, genotype of the crop is also considered as an important factor, uh, as an uh, important input into the yield prediction model. And uh, here, so this is about the yield prediction. Now the next session is about the deep learning based crop disease detection. So we can see in the literature, when we start from 2000, the major contribution started from 2016 with the publication of a uh, publicly available data set known as a planned village data set, which is um, uh, now much popular among the researchers who are doing the uh, experiment on the crop disease detection with the deep learning model. This is a publicly available data set with, uh, uh, which is cons consisting of about 54,000 uh, healthy and unhealthy leaf images, which is covering about uh, 26 type of diseases affecting 14 type of crops. And uh, they have used uh, two CNN architectures, that is AlisNet and GoogleNet in their experiment. Then again, another CNN-based model was developed um, in 2017 in order to identify the diseases in radish and cassava. And these data sets were collected from the um, uh, images uh, taken from Africa. Then um, another minutes. contribution in 2000. Two more minutes. Another contribution in 2017 is a comparison between three deep learning architectures, that is. Um, uh, faster RCCN and RCNN and RFCN in which the RFCN has uh, uh, shown the better result. 
Then another in 2018, Cfartan and Google Net is uh, used as a um, uh, used for comparison. Then in, uh, again, another two contribution is a disease detection model, which is based on DNN. And it has compared with the um, RF and the SVM. And DNN has used, um, shown the better results. Then another novel method in which the segmentation methods are also applied in order to localize the disease affected region. And when we come to 2019, uh, we can see Salvaraj is the author who has collected images from Southern India and Africa and has um, experimented with the ResNet inception uh, and mobile net in order to develop a disease detection model. Then another uh, deep, uh, neural network model is also experimented. Then, uh, uh, then Ali Ital is another major author who is uh, considering the disease uh, information also as input into the crop yield prediction model. So it is a unique work in which the crop yield prediction model is developed with the crop disease information also as an input into the um, uh, prediction. So um, it, is, it is showing that the crop disease is an important factor which is affecting the yield loss. Uh, then a leaf net model is another major contribution. Then in come, uh, when we come to 2020, uh, mathematical modeling is um, uh, proposed in which two algorithms are used for the, uh, for the uh, disease detection. Then SST is another uh, major model used for the crop disease detection. When we come to 2021, uh, leaf net is another contribution for the crop disease detection in which the viral um, disease is affecting the legumes in Indian scenario is considered. So uh, table six uh, and seven will answer the research question four and five, which is a major deep learning model uh, used for the uh, this is uh, detection. So resident 50 is considered to be the most popular model. And uh, these are the crops which are target crops which are subjected to study. And in this um, all works, we can see the leaf is a major part uh, which is subjected to study. The other parts are um, uh, not much uh, explored. Uh, so when we come to discussion, uh, as we already said, uh, question number one, two, and three were answered by table five and uh, two. And uh, so question four and five answered, uh, answered with table six and seven. So when we come to conclusion, we can say that um, a reasonable estimation of crop yield prediction and uh, disease detection is uh, very important for the farmers in uh, because uh, the uh, frequent outbreak of diseases and the unaware of the recent diseases is affecting their yield and also their daily income. Uh, so researchers have compared, in all their work, they have compared the um, uh, deep learning approaches with the traditional machine learning approaches, and they have found that uh, their research shows that the deep learning has out far, far outperformed the machine learning approaches. And the major um, popular uh, um, uh, model used by for both the yield prediction and disease detection CNN. So this survey aims to help the, um, those researchers who are trying to develop a deep learning model for the crop yield prediction and crop disease detection. So these are the references for this survey. Thank you. Yes, you have done a survey based upon certain raising certain questions and try to answer for that through your survey. And as a conclusion, you have come across that a deep neural network is good for your research activity. In that, CNN is the best among this deep neural network, that is RNN and CNN. But normally, deep learning is bombarded with a performance cost. Yes. So can you have any, uh, normally it is a, a fully packed with a high uh, performance cost. Mm -hmm. So have you come across in, uh, because we are not interested in that type of um, mm -hmm. uh, um, performance duration lasting, but uh, how, um, how this thing is handled in deep neural network or deep learning along with the CNN? Yes, ma'am. Uh, this uh, deep learning is consuming a huge um, uh, uh, means a time, and also um, we uh, need some complications are there. So when we come to the application level to the um, uh, farmers, farmers, uh, you know, to make them uh, usable, we are going for uh, recently when we come to uh, the current year uh, publications and all, they are uh, trying to implement this lightweight CNN. Uh, so lightweight CNN, they are consuming only less power, though their accuracy is much uh, some somewhat uh, lesser than the um, uh, major models. Uh, this lightweight CNN, like mobile net, uh, skews net, um, all these are able to um, be implemented with less uh, power consumption and with less time. And uh, so they can be embedded, in, uh, they can be embedded in Raspberry Pi or in I any of the IoT systems. Uh, so it, it can be um, uh, in any handheld devices or also it can be uh, run. So uh, this can be a, a major contribution um, and it will be helpful to the small farmers, actually, when compared to 
important uh, how you, why you are concluding to deep neural network because there are a lot of uh, machine learning you mentioned that uh, it is a uh, deep neural network have more potential than machine learning uh, when uh, compared to the um, amount of data set it's uh, complicated uh, but um, uh, when compared to the accuracy and uh, uh, the other parameters um, we, we found that the deep learning uh, models are um, also for image uh, analysis image process when we come to crop diseases mainly images are what characteristics of a deep learning mm -hmm. and also cnn helps in this uh, image processing yeah what characteristics for the uh, image processing um, uh, the cnn will help uh, better uh, in image processing uh, means image processing means uh, when compared to machine learning approaches the uh, cnn uh, is um, mainly the image yes, data uh, cnn and deep learning will be very good in a decision boundary management and what makes it to because it's an agriculture sector the uh, volume of data is uh, too high volume of data uh, so, yeah yes. um, a classification boundary uh, we need but we need it with a very clear uh, segregation between them hmm. uh, that is good with a uh, um, deep learning but what parameters of this deep learning and cnn helps for that but I it's a software accelerator okay. already built with a certain things there is no need to go in deep with but we have to understand what parameter help us to uh, switch our classification process to deep learning uh, because of the accuracy, it is uh, um, because of the accuracy it yields uh, the results uh, are more reliable when compared to the results we get from the machine learning. And um, currently, I think um, many of the work has switched over to lightweight CNN. Uh, earlier works were uh, whatever uh, is what the characteristics why you are choosing. Uh, because uh, the CNN are found to be good in um, uh, dealing with the image type of data and. Uh, 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 image type of data and uh, we are possible to implement uh, the lightweight architectures um, like a mobile net, uh, SKUs net, etc. Uh, so it will be easier to implement in the embedded systems and in our mobiles also it is as a mobile application also as a um, we, can, we are able to implement these architectures in handheld devices. So that is the reason why the in current years uh, most of this uh, works they are concentrating on this uh, lightweight CNNs for the crop disease uh, detection and all. It's anyway, go through what is the characteristics that makes you to choose so, this so one. Okay. And uh, uh, in normal machine learning, and it's a subset, is a, it's a deep neural network. Okay. Uh, whether the feature extraction and classification stand together in machine learning or in deep neural network, where this feature extraction and the classification stand together. Is in machine learning or is it in deep neural network? Uh, in um, in works, we have seen that the feature extraction they they have done as um, uh, two um, uh, two sessions like uh, first the extraction is done, then the classification like that it is done but in the in deep machine learning. Le deep learning. Go through all these things. Okay, uh, good analysis. But understand what is the characteristics, why you choose, why people are switching to researchers, switching to this uh, soft accelerator, the well-known accelerator is this uh, deep neural network. Okay. Now I call upon paper ID 26 to present chess moves prediction using deep learning neural networks. It will be an online presentation. Now I call upon paper ID 26 to present chess moves prediction using deep learning neural networks. It will be an online presentation. Thank you. 
Am I audible? Hello. Okay, so our topic is Now I call upon paper ID 26 to present Chessmo's prediction using deep learning neural networks. It is an online presentation. You can start now. Okay, thank you. So our to topic is Chessmo's prediction using deep learning neural networks. Myself, Hitanshu Panchal, and my teammates, Siddhant Mishra and Varsha Srivastava. So this is a list of contents that we will be discussing in today's presentation. So starting with the introduction, we all know that chess is a game that requires complex logical and strategical thinking. And in chess, short-term tactics built into long-term strategies. So implementing an algorithm for chess computers could be an approach to make chess computers more capable and more capable of computing against humans and against other computers as well. So uh, there are many algorithms that can be used to predict uh, chess moves. However, convolutional neural networks have shown great success in predicting uh, chess moves or uh, any other similar AI challenges too. Uh, in, uh, in convolutional neural networks, uh, Clark and Storkey have developed a model that predicts chess moves using Go. So uh, we can uh, say that convolutional neural networks when trained with appropriate architectures and valid data sets can catch up to human experience and do uh, complex logical tasks as well. So uh, our problem statement and our aim is to develop a system that learns chess based on the uh, games played by chess professionals and based on those trained games, it can compete against humans. So uh, we have divided our approach into two steps or you can say two parts. The first step is an evaluation function which basically uh, scores the current chess board and uh, determines uh, a score which uh, say uh, which uh, says that uh, how likely it is to win a game and uh, the next step is the search function which basically predicts or uh, you can say it searches the best move that can be used using the uh, uh, previous evaluation score calculator in the previous step so uh, the workflow of the system so the diagram on the right uh, shows the architecture of our neural network. First, uh, in the input layer, the convolutional neural network will receive an input of shape 8 by 8 by 14. Yeah, 8 by 8 by 14. And uh, followed by it, there will be four convolutional layers uh, through which this input will be passed. Each convolutional layer have 32 filters of size 3 by 3 each. Following it is a flattening layer, which basically takes the eight by eight by 32 shaped input and flattens it into an array of 2048 neurons. So uh, next to the flattening layer are two dense layers. The first dense layer contains 64 neuron, which takes as an input the 2048 activations from the previous flattening layer, and it converts it into a 64 neurons activations. The last layer, uh, it contains just a single neuron and it outputs a value between zero and one. And it this value between zero and one uh, basically indicates the state of the board. So if the value is more nearer to one, we can say that white is doing better in the game. And if it is black, uh, uh, it is nearer to zero, we can say that uh, black is doing better in the game. Now all the layers except the last layer uses ReLU activation function, which determine which neuron will be fired and the last layer uses a sigmoid activation function. Since uh, a sigmoid activation function uh, also limits the output between zero and one. So it is a good choice for us. So moving on uh, to the Minimax algorithm. Minimax algorithm is a traditional chess algorithm. Uh, as we know that chess is a zero sum game. So what it means is basically uh, in chess, maximizing your chances of winning is same as 
minimizing the other opponent's chances of winning. So, uh, considering that uh, both the players are good players and uh, both uh, play optimally, the game can be expected to be long. However, if uh, if one person blunders, so we can expect that the uh, other player will take advantage of it and the game can be short. So, uh, moving on to the whole uh, implementation, as we know, as discussed earlier, the convolutional neural networks outputs a probability or a single value between 0 and 1, which indicates the board state. Then, using a list of legal moves for a, the given position, we pick uh, the, the probability which results in the highest probability, uh, highest uh, evaluation score. So, basically, when applying a minimized algorithm, white basically tries to maximize the score, whereas black tries to minimize it. Uh, as we can see on the diagram on the right, uh, for in, in the top layer, we try to maximize it, and in the second layer, we try to minimize it and in third layer, which is white stun, it also again tries to maximize it. So it's basically a cycle of maximizing and minimizing the, on each turn. So now with the experimental setup. So uh, our data set consists of 15 lakh chess game states and the model is trained on 1 lakh 2400 of those games. Uh, now to uh, feed our chess board to the convolutional neural network, we represented it as an 8 by 8 by 14 shape input. Now, 8 by 8, of course, represents the uh, chess board, which is of, uh, mat, uh, of square 8 by 8. And the 14 channels, uh, there are 6 for each piece type of white, 6 for each piece type of black. And there are two additional, which basically represents the attackable squares by white and black, respectively. So on the diagram on the right, we can see that on the bottom right corner, on the top one, there is a king. So uh, all the its adjacent cells are marked one, since a king can move one step at a time. However, the, uh, the square on the left of the king is not marked one because it is attacked by the opponent color's bishop. So obviously, uh, it is not a legal move to move into check for a king. That's why it is not marked one. So in this way, we represented our uh, chessboard and we fed it to a neural uh, to our neural network. Next comes the results and discussions part. So the diagram on the right here, uh, it shows the accuracy of, of our model. Uh, it is plotted based on predicted playable moves. So uh, playable moves as in uh, the moves that are not blunders and are not bad to play, but at the same time, they are not the best move to play. So our model gives around 40% of accuracy for the move on the neural network. And uh, it, uh, it does not mean that the rest uh, of the time, the model did not learn. So it just means that our model did not uh, assume the best move as the move that the pro players of chess used to assume. So uh, in this uh, slide, the image on the left represents the array representation of our chessboard and the image on the right shows the GUI representation. So uh, as you can see, the lowercase letters represent PCs for black as P says pawn and R says rook. And the uh, uppercase letters uh, are uh, the pieces that are of white. So uh, we tested our model against various uh, levels of stockfish. And uh, on the lower levels of stockfish, uh, we got a few victories and uh, uh, some draws and mostly were losses. On higher levels, we got only draws and losses. So uh, we have also included uh, special moves like uh, queen side castling and king side castling and uh, empress, uh, there are three special moves. So uh, our model will be able to predict those moves as well if uh, they occur to be the best moves in a particular situation. So moving on towards the conclusion. So to conclude essentially, uh, our convolutional neural network basically pre-computes an evaluation function so that it can predict directly on a given chessboard state or on a given situation. So uh, CNN also does give a better possibility of what will happen in the future. So uh, if uh, uh, extensive research is applied on various properties, such as chess endgames and uh, chess rook to king endgames, then it can show better results as well. Also in convolutional neural network, search is around 80,000 positions for a game state as compared to 70 million which is searched by Shopfish, which saves execution time as well. Now, uh, for future scope, we can also apply 
reinforcement learning so that uh, it can it will majorly improve the accuracies for predicting chess moves as well uh, these are the references that we use uh, some of the papers that we use for uh, developing this system thank you uh, if any question and answers please feel, please feel free to ask Hello. Hello, am I audible? Can you hear me? Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes. So CNN, is it a supervised or unsupervised learning? Uh, we have here used it as a supervised learning. Uh, as I said, uh, uh, we are uh, taking the chess board as an input of 8 by 8 by 14 input and corresponding to that, we have a label which uh, label in our data set which already has the value of 4. Okay. And uh, um, this uh, chess game is best with the is it with the machine learning or is it with the, is it with the artificial intelligence? Can you define these two? Chess game is the best suit to is it to machine learning or is it to artificial intelligence AI? AI is the uh, major domain, but still it yeah. has its own definition. Yeah, actually uh, we can. Uh, I think it is best suited to artificial intelligence. And uh, it can uh, yes like, why as we know that yeah uh, like uh, as we know that uh, the world class engine stockfish it it does not use machine learning uh, to predict it there are certain like prospects in chess like the piece activity uh, like uh, uh, which color has the more space over the board and uh, the so what is actually happening in AI uh, and, what is, uh, that is related to chess also. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't get you. Like, uh, what is actually uh, happening in chess that is common in the definition of AI? Yeah, as uh, as I said, that uh, a person wants to play a chess game against a computer. So a computer should be intelligent enough that, uh, like, uh, it knows the rules of the games, right? And it also knows that uh, we are what the current game state is. So it should know which move to be played and. It, it needs to be like a, uh, in its own intelligence uh, based on the piece activity, as I said. Is it the decision is making at each move or is it the decision that we take to final goal? Uh, no, it, 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 uh, it considers the depth, to be honest, uh, like, a, like a, we can set the depth field. So if, if we uh, take the depth as zero, then it will just uh, take the current board state and it will uh, like on each move, it will make a decision. And uh, if we, we take a depth, then it will consider three, four moves ahead if the depth is three or four. And we can also uh, like uh, provide any number for the depth. So if we say 20, then it will go, uh, like it will apply minimax algorithm till 20 levels, and it will make a decision on that basis. Well, why not you uh, make an improved version of a minimax? Because uh, simply we are traversing through the unnecessary path in that term. yeah uh, yeah yeah we 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 have implemented alpha beta pruning in uh, minimax algorithm so uh, like uh, if if you are already getting uh, a good output from here then we will no, not go here like uh, if we are getting zero here and we say we are getting one here right so obviously this uh, uh, this black wants to minimize it so it will not go there it will trim, it will basically trim some of the branches of it. Why you choose uh, ReLU as an activation function though? Uh, actually, uh, as we said that we uh, we had our data set as in zeros and ones, right? So we were going to perform linear activations and all those things. So uh, like uh, in zeros and ones, we only needed the output at the end last step to be between zero and one. So we used the last as a sigma activation function. And others, uh, we thought that ReLU activation function would be a good fit. Also, we have used an atom optimizer. Have you compared this uh, architecture model with uh, any existing model? Uh, yes. To justify that uh, uh, your 
architecture or methodology is uh, compatibly best with existing? Yeah, actually, uh, as I said that uh, we have also uh, uh, in testing phase, we have just uh, uh, Mm, we have tested it against the stockfish, which is currently a wild class engine. So on that, we are on low levels. We are getting a few uh, wins, and uh, although maximum of them are drones, uh, however, uh, considering the data set, like we only have fifteen lakh, and in chess uh, there are up to like two into ten raised to six, forty six uh, positions that can occur in chess. So uh, basically, uh, considering our data set, we are getting uh, good results as compared to it. Have you shown the performance measure that uh, according to your architecture? Uh, we have shown the graph of accuracies. <laughs> like we are. Uh, yes, one, one doubt is that uh, what's the outcome of your um, uh, uh, network? Is it uh, the move is uh, uh, through the goal or not? Or it is giving you a better move? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, what, uh, is the, what is the outcome of the architecture? Whether it is saying about whether your present move is moving to the goal or um, the best move among all. Uh, the, uh, binary output, that is yes or no. Is the move is uh, leading to the goal? Uh, no, actually we are, uh, the our architecture, our convolutional neural network, it basically outputs a number between zero and one. So, that's right. What that zero and one represents? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So no, it, it does not like. Uh, it can be zero point one also. Like I'm. It it is between zero and one. It is not zero or one. So what that indicates? Yeah. If if the output is towards one, right? Suppose it is zero point eight, then it indicates that white is winning currently. And if it is towards, uh, it is nearer to zero. Then it indicates that black is winning. That is why white is always going to try to maximize the evaluation score. While whereas black will always try to minimize it, and uh, there are some positions where uh, in one move it is a checkmate. So at that time it will uh, output a one, which means that uh, in the next move white will obviously checkmate and it will win the game. Okay, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Any other questions? No, it's over. Okay, thank you for the opportunity, ma'am. Now I call upon paper ID 29 to present a comparison on instance segmentation models. Please note it will be a 10 minute presentation. Hello, hello. Can I start? Okay. Good afternoon to one and all present here. Uh, my name is Nipun Anu, and today I'll be presenting on the paper, a comparison on instance segmentation models. This paper has been done by, with the help of uh, three other people, uh, Sanju, Praveen, Prasid, and my uh, faculty, um, uh, and my guide, uh, Paul Augustine, sir. And, uh, I'll be talking about uh, what this paper entails. So before I start, I need to talk to you about what this instant segmentation means. So instant segmentation, and after that, I'll talk about some of the three models that have uh, been uh, that have been considered uh, as the state of the art instant segmentation models. And then I compare it where I compare all of these models with a single data set. Then I'll move on to the next slide and I'll talk about it. Okay, introduction. So deep learning, it's a subclass of machine learning. Uh, it uh, depends on artificial neural networks. So basically artificial neural networks try to get us the working of a human brain. So in our thing, we are trying to uh, emulate the uh, human vision in a computer. So computer can identify objects and such. So uh, as we all know, 
so our paper is going to discuss about that. So as we all know, uh, in like phones and stuff, we have like object detection already like running, but uh, this is another method. Uh, so the problem with just uh, object detection is that uh, it only identifies the location of that object in an image and does not give us an idea about like the shape or the size of the object, which is which can be done by uh, another method called semantic segmentation. But semantic segmentation also has uh, does not give us the location of that object, uh, so that therefore you cannot count the number of objects in that. So I'll talk. Uh, so for that, so there's this method called instant segmentation. It does both the um, uh, image, uh, object detection and se uh, semantic segmentation, and I'll show it to you in the next slide. So as you can see in this next figure, uh, there's a picture of uh, there's four pictures. Uh, each with uh, different uh, models. So this image classification just detects the presence of the uh, of the object in the image. So there are three uh, three objects: person, sheep, dog. The object detection is able to find the uh, location of that image. Uh, it finds the location of image, but the, it does not give us an idea about how the dog looks like, how the person looks like. It just says there's a person inside that bounding box given in that picture. Semantic segmentation. The, it is able to identify whether the pixel of that image belongs to that uh, object. So for uh, in this case, you can see the goats are like, uh, the sheep are like uh, colored as blue. But the problem with this method is that it is not able to identify how many sheep are there, how many dogs. It only identifies whether this pixel belongs to a certain class of an object. So. If we uh, combine the ideas of the object localization, that is detection and the semantic segmentation, it leads us to this thing called instant segmentation. And okay, so I'll be talking about some of the models in instant segmentation. Uh, I'll just talk about three. Uh, okay, so the first one is Swinnell model. In the Swinnell model, it is, a, it is like a vision transformer. As we all know in NLP, we use transformers uh, in transformer, we pass sentences, and uh, those sentences are converted into tokens. And uh, within each layer, we try to find uh, pass through several layers, and then we try to find uh, like a feature. The problem with doing this with like images is the fact that uh, images has a lot of pixels and a variable size resolution. So the only the problem with doing vision transfer the vision transformer was. Uh, transformer is not able to do it on like a um, do it on like a, a very high resolution image. It's only able to do on a low resolution. But this mod model, which was introduced by Microsoft, uh, the Swinnell transformer, it talks about uh, implementing a hierarchical transformer where there's like a patch partitioning of each of the uh, resolution image. So for let's say in this image, I take an image of height, width, and uh, three, which is the uh, red, green, uh, blue channels. They just passed in the patch, patch partition and uh, each, uh, each image is uh, uh, converted into several non-overlapping patches. And this non-overlapping patches are then passed on to this linear embedding layer, which, uh, which converts this into, uh, which filters and tokenizes it. Uh, the problem, uh, so instead of just doing it on like every, every, um, every token vector, uh, it just uh, does it on like a uh, set number of tokens. Uh, so like M number of tokens, M number of tokens, and then we transform it. When we transform it, we in merge the patches together to form another patch. And then we repeat the stage over and over for the next architecture. This, this allows us to uh, increase the uh, uh, time. Like, uh, so it increases the compute, uh, takes less time to do the, uh, Vision transformer. So vision transformer has this. Uh, so doesn't uh, doesn't need like a big O of n square like a, like n square computational complexity for this task. So it just has O of n into m, which where you can take the m as like a small value for the uh, like uh, for the linear embedding thing, and then we are able to get the uh, uh, we are able to get it in like a smaller less amount of time. Then I'll talk about YOLO plus plus. This has been inspired by the YOLO uh, object model, which has only one stage. In YOLO plus plus, 
uh, thing is in instance segmentation models, most of the instance segmentation models come by, uh, has like two stages. One, uh, it tries to figure out where the uh, object is and two, it localizes, tries to localize the object and find the, the object, uh, mask the object, classify the object and like it does the uh, bounding box regression and classification of the mask. Uh, uh, apparently also does the masking. This uh, this is uh, pretty slow in like doing real time instance segmentation. So this uh, paper uh, claims that it is able to run on like uh, do the instance segmentation on like a YouTube like a live stream video for like thirty on like thirty FPS on this on like a Intel Xeon uh, graphics card. Next is mask CNN. Uh, it has been developed in uh, two thousand seventeen by like the Facebook AI research group. Uh, it has been done in like two stages. It uh, so the one I talked about uh, where you propose the region of the identified objects, and uh, also we predict the class and the box offset. And uh, there's an additional uh, additional task of mask branch, as you can see in that image, where it tries to predict the mask, and uh, each pixel is converted to that binary mask. So for this, I used a single data set. Uh, it's a it's, this data set is called MS Coker data set. Uh, this data set is uh, frequently is used for commonly training like the object detection model, instance segmentation, and key point detection. And so these uh, this data set uh, is pretty useful uh, for like testing whether your model works. So it's a large scale data set with like 80 classes and 1.5 million object instances. So here's like a table. In this table, you can see the mask, uh, the, the worst performing model in comparison with average precision bounding box, which is the uh, which is the precision value of the bounding box predicted when compared to the ground truth of the image. That uh, there's a like, uh, your lag plus plus does not favor well compared to other models, but what it does well is the fact that it can do this in like uh, a fast, uh, it is able to do, uh, it can skip a stage, essentially. There's only uh, the, uh, there's two stages like, uh, so it only does one stage of like uh, predict, it does both the um, prediction of the image instance and the uh, uh, classification in like a single stage. Uh, what Masca Sen and all other models have to do it in like different, two different stages. And uh, yeah, so we can see that. And then uh, average precision bounding box for like this, uh, uh, in, uh, for like uh, Yola, uh, Swinnell is pretty much the best. But uh, uh, it comes at the uh, cost of the fact that it's a vision transformer, which takes a lot of time to train. Two more minutes. Okay, so I'll be concluding this uh, presentation by saying uh, Swinnell is the most accurate, but it's a vision transformer. So this uh, model can, uh, even though it uh, it has, oh, uh, we have reduced the uh, complexity into a linear like. Uh, Linear complexity. It still takes more time when compared to other models like Mask CNN and uh, Yolac plus plus, and Yolac plus. Uh, so and now I'll say about that instant segmentation is still a field where uh, the real time instant segmentation could be uh, more improved, perhaps for like sixty uh, much more greater FPS than what Yolac plus plus is uh, achieving, and of course the training time is much more. Uh, uh, it's uh, higher when compared to like object detection and uh, object detection, yeah. And these are some of the references. Oh. So what we have explained are the available tools for this uh, yeah. uh, instant segmentation yeah. process. Yeah, I have talked about the three models Mo that like- Tools, yeah. the models means that is available tools. Yeah, tools, okay. okay. And according to the complexity of these three, which one having the less complexity? The less complexity is the YOLAC plus plus because uh, YOLAC plus plus, uh, even though it takes, okay, if you talk about training the model, it takes uh, a little more, uh, more time, but when you run it, uh, when we run the model on like a live video, it, uh, it, perform, uh, it is able to infer uh, in like 30 FPS thing, uh, the masking of the v uh, the objects in that uh, video frame is done like in 30 FPS. So that is the like the fastest I could say. I think uh, which one is uh, built up with the CNN? 
That is Which the one? third model. Mass Kassianan. Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, whether these three models is, uh, um, can run on a same platform, if any additional features are required from a common platform? No, no, we can run this on like- uh, so You mentioned about the graphics card and all yeah, this. That, that, that is for your lag plus plus. For your lag plus plus, uh, you can run it on this high graphics card and then only you can achieve this 30 FPS. That's what That's I mean why by- Maybe it is a more less complex as a competitor, not less, it can get a quick uh, yeah, response. It's quick. Quick Only inference. because of his uh, hardware support, maybe. Yeah, it requires hardware support. So instant segmentation still like uh, needs a lot of hardware uh, for this. So it's still being developed. Yeah. And uh, you mentioned about a masking on this. Yeah. Uh, masking means uh, you have already have a collection of uh, um, a collection of that image. Yeah. Outline. So in like so this. Yeah. If it is not that uh, image collection is not there, is it able to identify it? No. Like, what do you mean? Like masking is the yeah. to identify that. So, uh, not every object got get uh, have its mask the yeah. So in that situation, what happens? So it's a pre-trained. Yeah, models. I think the data set uh, has been like um, already like uh, like trained. This poker data set I've been talking about has already has this masking and all done. Though, so we can just pass those. Uh, data set into those models. Can, can we then, update our own data set? To yeah, that? we can. We can. So, if you want to uh, change the, if you let's say I want to detect like small berries in a field, like I just want to detect like blueberries. Yeah. This uh, Coco data set does not have that uh, object category, like that class to detect blueberries. So, what you can do is you can take a pre trained, uh, uh, pre trained uh, model that has been trained on that uh, Coco data set. Then you can change some of the parameters inside that so that you only try to detect like the blueberries. And with that, you can, uh, yeah, you can change the objects. Yeah. And, uh, and that RCNN that uh, um, you mentioned about its uh, outcome is a classifier and also a regression. How yeah. come that too? So, oh, okay. So RCNN, this is like an, uh, this mask RCNN is basically an extension of faster RCNN, which I not talked about. So faster RCNN, if you want to talk about it, uh, it's a uh, uh, faster RCNN tries to uh, extract the features. So when you get the features, uh, this mask RCNN has like two additional stages. Those uh, first stage is where the RPN, the region proposal network, where in that uh, the mask, uh, the, uh, the region proposal network tries to figure out the region in which, a, uh, like uh, tries to figure out regions where the object could be located. And then we pass that feature into uh, another stage. So those, it has like two parallel stages. So those fully connected layers that has box regression and classification. So in box regression, uh, we have found a region we try to regress the bounding box so that it, uh, it fix, uh, fits the uh, image, uh, the object more uh, accurately. And also we, does, we do that classification at the same time. And uh, also while we are doing that, we are parallelly adding another mask overhead, which, uh, which, which only does like, uh, which only adds like a five millisecond overhead like for that uh, masking. And then you will be able to mask the object also, yeah. So this uh, this uh, models all having semantic analysis also. Yeah, it has semantic. Uh, the semantic uh, yeah detection is there. like uh, it does both the object detection and semantic segmentation, right? So if we do both of them, we combine uh, the both the outputs of that is combined to get like semantic uh, semantic segment uh, to get the instant segmentation. So in, like uh, that's the problem with that uh, met, uh, instant segmentation. Uh, because we are doing both of those uh, methods, like semantic and object detection, it, like uh, it requires more computational resources compared to like an uh, object detector like YOLO or like some RCN. Both three are doing the same thing. Which one? Yeah, three both models. are doing to doing the same thing in like different ways. This one is like doing with the uh, RCN and uh, the the uh, the one I talked about, Swinnell transformer. 
uh, it tries to uh, do that for like the uh, vision transformer like in like uh, in nlp we have transformer right like uh, we get the word sentences we get converted oh, into see. tokens token vectors are then passed on to our several layers so, yeah we are trying to replicate that with like uh, so in all, but you yeah, like uh, normal vision. If you just use transformer without doing any like uh, changes to it, the problem is that uh, the image size is not constant, and uh, we cannot. Uh, there's like uh, it, you can, uh, and it's not constant. And it co contains a lot of uh, vectors, right? Like a lot of tokens. Like uh, you, you. If you have like a image of. 124 and 124, one there's a lot of pixels. The other one is based upon what? The one Which more one? is the? Your lag plus plus. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's based on like the YOLO object model. Like, uh, so the uh, thing is, uh, like in mask uh, CNN, like this one also uses CNN. Okay. Uh, That's what not, I'm asking. Yeah. Uh -huh. This one also uses CNN. The only thing is, instead of uh, giving another stage where it tries to localize that, ob uh, that uh, bound, like you have detected the region. Then you try to uh, uh, regress that bounding box. You try to classify it. I also add the masking, like a different stage. It, it takes more time. So instead of doing that, uh, it, this does this in one step. So there's like a fully connected layer, C1 to C5 and P1. So those images pass through that uh, with the sum of the, and uh, then, uh, then the predict the features are then passed to the prediction head. Mm -hmm. And then it's compared with the protonet. The protonet is the thing where it tries to, Give like four different uh, uh, prototypes of that masking. Okay. That uh, already CNN is very much capable of uh, object detection and object positioning. Yeah. So uh, I I think that is good to uh, use for this object detection model. Yeah. CNN itself have that potential. Yeah, CNN also. Yeah. Yeah, but the thing is like uh, I'm trying this thing. Uh, of CNN can do object detection. It can also do semantic segmentation. I mean, semantic Lo segmentation. Location identification is also yeah. good with the CNN. Yeah. The only issue with that is it's pretty slow. That's the That's like fine. the instant segmentation. Like if you do all of those, like uh, so, this could be a better method. We try it with the CNN also, whether it is giving you anything. So that we can. Uh, um, how you are on customizing your concept yeah, cool. instead of using these uh, tools. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Next, I call upon paper ID 32 to present com commodity based risk prediction system for ARDS in COVID 19 patients. It's an online presentation. Now I call upon paper ID 32 to present commodity based risk prediction system for ARDS in COVID-19 patients. It's an online presentation. And please note it will be a 10 minute presentation.
Now I call upon Nitin Rajesh to present commodity-based risk prediction system for ARDS in COVID-19 patients. Please note, it will be a 10 minute presentation. You may start. You're not audible. Hello, am I audible? Yeah. audible yes. Uh, I can't uh, share anything. Share my screen. I can't share my screen. Yeah, okay. Uh, I got the option now. Uh, Okay, uh, is it visible? Yes, sure. Um, so, um, uh, this is our paper presentation and my name is Nitin Rajesh. Yes. Uh, good afternoon to you all. Uh, so, our paper is based on comorbidity based risk prediction. Uh, and uh, this project is guided by Renu Mary Daniel Ma'am. Uh, group members of my projects are uh, myself, Nitin Rajesh, Vaishak TP, and Umesh PL. So, uh, moving to the contents. Uh, so, first, uh, I'll give you give you a brief introduction about the project and the paper. Then I'll uh, 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 give you the aims uh, of the uh, paper, and um, finally, I, I will show the uh, proposed methods uh, as well as the results. So introduction. So COVID-19 affected almost uh, 240 million pe uh, people worldwide and uh, it cost around uh, for four, four, 4 million deaths. So uh, COVID-19 COVID is usually a mild uh, infection uh, which affects only the respiratory system. But uh, some people are, um, uh, ex are experiencing severe uh, infections uh, and these people usually have underlying medical conditions. 
treating co these serious complications um, require require a lot of medical resources. Uh, ARDS is one of the most uh, co most common complications associated with uh, COVID nineteen patients. So uh, the um, uh, scope of the pro project uh, was to design a system uh, that um, uh, that detects uh, higher risk uh, patients to ARDS, um, and uh, so that we can allocate medical resources for these patients. Patients and uh, to, uh, by doing this, we can reduce the overall uh, deaths caused by COVID nineteen. Uh, to find out, um, and this will all also help us to find out more about the COVID nineteen disease and uh, which uh, or diseases uh, underlying health health complicate uh, underlying diseases ca causes a COVID patient uh, to suffer from more serious infections. So uh, the data set is obtained from a Mexican government uh, and Mexican government or uh, you uh, updates this data set uh, daily. And this data set contains not only just um, a COVID patients data, but, uh, but also um, uh, you know, other patients data. And this uh, patients data is uh, an anonymized and um, I'll show you how the data set looks like. So, uh, so this is how the data set looks like. So, uh, so you can see uh, the sex of the patient. Uh, uh, sex of the patient is there. Then the pa whether the patient is intubed or not. Um, then uh, whether the patient is suffer suffering from pneumonia, etc. So, um, uh, so one uh, one con corresponds to the patient suf is suffering from the. A particular disease and uh, two corresponds to you know the patient is not suffering uh, and um, and uh, there are entry and uh, entry dates uh, which uh, correspond to uh, admission dates um, to a particular hospital uh, and uh, there's a, a column called uh, date of death so uh, if a patient died uh, here uh, there will be a valid date uh, so uh, uh, and uh, using this entry date, uh, we and the symptoms date, uh, we calculated how long uh, a COVID patient waited before getting medical treatment, which is also uh, very important uh, uh, because uh, getting treatment in the earlier phase uh, helps us uh, reduce the risk of uh, COVID-19 uh, complications. Uh, other other features are um, age, diabetics, um, COPD, asthma, etc. Uh, these are all uh, very common disease, uh, diseases, and uh, usually uh, the patient can uh, patient usually knows about this. Uh, so there is no need to um, no need for a lab uh, result. So uh, that that is very helpful during a pandemic situation like this. Uh, so. So let's move on to the next slide. Okay, assumptions. Um, uh, so the patients are admitted to the ICU are uh, consume, uh, are assumed to be uh, critical. So uh, we are not taking uh, into consideration a patient's uh, financial uh, uh, financial condition. Um, so. Uh, then uh, the treatment uh, provided by the medical staff is assumed to be equal and the quality of the treatment is also assumed to be equal. Uh, so more, moving on to the next slide. So um, the solutions um, considered for this project were um, KNN algorithm, gradient boosted tree, XT boosted tree, ADA boost, uh, and random forest. So so let's move to SVM. So um, SVM is used to classify um, um, uh, data points into two, uh, two categories. So here you can see uh, in the first image, uh, we draw a line and this, dry, uh, line, and this line is called hyperplane. And um, uh, we draw a line uh, trying to separate uh, uh, the two uh, classifications. Uh, if we can't separate, uh, uh, if we can't separate uh, uh, 
the two classifications in x and y axis um, i mean x and y plane we consider another plane uh, so if you look at the image at the bottom we can see uh, other planes are considered so uh, in the x and z plane uh, it's very easy to um, very easy to um, draw a line and divide uh, the classifications so um, uh, the hyperplane is drawn and um, um, a margin is drawn on either side of the hyperplane the more distance between the margins the better uh, will be the accuracy and the lesser will be the overfitting so let's move on to the next algorithm so ANN, um, ANN or artificial neural networks. So here we have uh, three layers, input layer, output layer, and hidden layer. So input layer uh, usually uh, contains all the uh, features uh, which we feed into the uh, uh, network. Uh, and these features are used to uh, uh, give the output prediction. Hidden layer consists of many neurons um, and uh, increasing and decreasing uh, uh, these uh, layers can um, affect the um, accuracy of the uh, accuracy of the model and uh, output layer usually contains um, in our case it you it contains two um, two nodes uh, because uh, this is a binary prediction so uh, either the uh, patient is classified as a high risk patient or a low risk patient so in the output layer we have uh, two nodes in our case uh, so moving on to uh, the next algorithm we can uh, used was uh, random forest. So um, uh, in random forest, we uh, we take the training data set and we divide it divide into uh, a lot of subsets, and uh, and uh, we we make a lot of uh, decision trees. And each of these decision trees are trained on different subsets, uh, which is obtained from the main training set uh, training set. So uh, after um, after training. Um, on different uh, subsets, uh, we we use all the uh, we use all the decision trees to come to a final conclusion, and all the decision trees have a equal say in the final uh, uh, prediction. Uh, which uh, prediction class is voted the most is taken as the final prediction. Um, uh, okay, next uh, we considered was KNN algorithm. So here. Uh, we take, um, uh, uh, for example, we are predicting a point and um, suppose uh, we are uh, taking uh, the value of um, uh, five as the number of neighbors, then we will consider five nearest points to the um, uh, point which we are trying to predict. And, um, and usually we take uh, odd numbers uh, and um, uh, whichever um, uh, whichever uh, five closest members um, and and we try to take the uh, most common uh, prediction class uh, so uh, as you can see in the bottom image um, uh, here the um, number of uh, neighbors is taken as three and you can see one red uh, class uh, data point and two green uh, uh, data points so class b will be taken as uh, the final prediction uh, okay, so Ada Boost. Uh, Ada Boost uses uh, stumps, uh, and uh, stumps are a uh, uh, stumps instead of decision trees. And uh, uh, we use a collection of uh, stumps to pre uh, produce a prediction. Uh, stumps can be uh, uh, can use only one variable to make a decision. Uh, each stump is created based on the errors uh, made by the previous stump. Um, uh, errors made by the previous stump is gradually corrected in the next stump. Uh, and uh, not all stumps uh, have the equal say in the final prediction. Um, the, uh, the more accurate st uh, stumps will have the um, have the more uh, have the have more importance during the final prediction. Uh, okay, gradient boosted tree. So gradient boosted tree uh, is similar to uh, random forest, but um, uh, uh, unlike random forest, uh, where each um, 
a tree is uh, created simultaneously um, uh, in gradient boosted tree each tree um, each tree is created one after another and uh, uh, we use learning rate uh, to prevent overfitting so uh, if you keep the learning rate low um, the the prediction will correct itself very slowly um, and uh, yeah two more minutes yeah okay uh, so yeah um and um, uh, the learning rate affects the um, uh, uh, overall affects the um, uh, accuracy of the model uh, then uh, xg boost so uh, xg boost um, so xg boost is an uh, ensembling tree uh, tree method um, using a, a gradient boosted architecture and it fo follows um, principles like boosting and uh, weak learners uh, however this algorithm has a lot of optimizations and uh, uh, thus it can be um, run in a parallel way um, so the um, uh, running and execution of the uh, model is very fast uh, now let's move on to the results. So, um, so we got the highest accuracy uh, with um, gradient boosted tree, um, a gradient boosted tree as well as um, uh, XG boost. So, um, uh, in gradient boosted tree, we had an increase in um, uh, increase in uh, accuracy, and uh, that was because uh due to the uh, we changed the number of uh, decision trees to 200 and the learning rate was set to 0 0.3 and we also altered the maximum depth to 8 um so this resulted in increased um, accuracy and um uh, in ada boost uh what we changed was um yeah um uh, we gave the final number of trees um, to 9,000. So this improved the uh, accuracy from so 0 0.76 to uh, 0 0.92. So uh, yeah, uh, ex uh, and uh, here we can see mo almost all the ensembling techniques uh, scored a really good um, uh, F1 score. Uh, future scopes uh, of this uh, paper is uh, effects of different strains of coronavirus can be ob observed on a patient um, and uh, we can use this uh, uh, use this to predict uh, resources needed during the next pandemic uh, conclusion uh, uh, we intend uh, we intend for this project to successfully classify uh, critical covid patients on the basis of their uh, medical history um, um, so this will help us uh, reduce um, uh, COVID deaths and uh, increase uh, the um, utilization of medical resources. Thank you. Am I audible to you? Yes, ma'am. What is the size of the feature vector? Uh, uh, ma'am, are you asking about the data set? Because you have selected certain parameters for classification. Because we need our feature yeah. vector, which mentions about the characteristics of the patient. So what are the parameters that are, or I need the number of parameters that we had taken for them? Uh, uh, we took almost uh, 12 parameters and uh, uh, I dis uh, and I, I can show that. So, uh, so um, we took uh, so you can see uh, pneumonia, age, uh, di uh, diabetes, um, uh, COPD. Uh, these uh, diseases, uh, um, diseases like this, we took for uh, our final prediction: hypertension, uh, etc. Uh, uh, it's uh, around twelve features, ma'am. So it should be sure about that. Yeah, ma'am. Is it 12? Uh, yes, ma'am, 12. And the range of value that you are given for each parameter? Um, except uh, age is the only uh, continuous value in our data set. Other all um, uh, age uh, as well as the number of days uh, a patient waited to get a treatment. Uh, those are the only two uh, uh, continuous values. Other all values are uh, just yes or no values. 
as you listed certain set of classifiers them yeah. have you come across with any potential of potential for these classifiers uh ma'am uh, what we try to do was uh, uh, we try to see uh, based we, upon feature vector length um uh, we found that ensemble techniques work the best uh yeah ensemble why, why? uh why ma'am because uh, we suffered a, a very less um um uh, uh uh we suffered very less uh, okay have you come across with any unsupervised learning method in this classifier uh yes ma'am uh, we used um, a n n uh, and uh, it's unsupervised no uh sorry ma'am no 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 we didn't we didn't uh, use any unsupervised methods okay which kernel function is used in svm uh uh hold on second ma'am uh, we used we used poly ma'am poly why you use that one we have a set of uh, three or four yes ma'am uh, is them yeah ma'am uh, we we executed all uh, all three uh, uh all three uh, kernels and uh, poly gave us the most uh, reliable uh, prediction ma'am why uh, which parameter of that helps you to get the best uh ma'am uh, uh, uh poly uh, in that poly was the most important uh, parameter which helped us uh, get um, the most accurate value uh, because uh, it uh, other other more other kernel types suffered from overfitting ma'am so normal in normal way the what are things you are using you have to find out an answer why you are using what is its potential so in future while you are doing the research work so you have to think about why i am using this for this particular application what characteristics of this application supports by this classifier or whatever methodology you have used and last question yeah. uh, you have list out uh, f measure and uh, uh, accuracy yeah uh, test training and which one you will uh, valued more in order to accept a um, uh, architecture uh ma'am uh, testing uh, i'm not uh, testing uh, uh, yeah ma'am testing accuracy ma'am then why you use f measure what is f measure f1 score uh ma'am uh, in our case uh, f f1 score uh, is um is similar to all um uh is similar in uh, similar ma'am so uh, we we will use a f1 score but uh, out of training can you, and can you can you say uh, define this f1 score with a, um uh, this the formula ma'am yes uh, that is true positive true negative yeah, or you so... can call it with a precision or recall what's the formula yeah so f1 uh, uh, you can calculate f1 by using uh, 2 into precision into recall by uh, precision uh, plus recall so or, or you can use uh, true like uh, true positives and true uh, like uh, false negatives like uh, you can use uh, that method also to find uh, f1 so uh, so as by that uh, it is a ratio of what uh ma'am it's a ratio of uh, uh uh ratio of uh, two negatives true for two uh, false negatives two positives all together like uh uh well, like so the what uh, the thing is that what all things you are introducing in your slide uh, have a thorough uh, knowledge about that otherwise don't place it there because this uh, accuracy it's sufficient to explain that it's a common term yeah okay what is the um, uh, data size classification between training and test among this how much percentage you are taken so uh, 70 30 versus split ma'am have you done cross validation on the training set yes ma'am um, but what is the didn't... what is the ratio uh, that you are, how many uh, uh, um, folding you have Uh, we tried five as well as ten folding, uh, but we didn't find any yeah, uh, accuracy improvements. After what? Which one? Um, five or uh, ten? Uh, no, ma'am. Uh, both, uh, because um, um, uh, 
like uh, in the assembling uh, methods, we didn't find any accuracy improvements. But uh, SVM and uh, uh, SVM and KNN uh, improved. Uh, we we improved accuracy using uh, cross validation. Uh, KNN, what K stands for? Uh, K stands for number of uh, holes, ma'am. Uh, number of uh, uh, holes. Can it be an even number? Uh, 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 yes, uh, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, we are in uh, KNN, uh, it's, uh, we, it, uh, K can't be an even number, um, K is supposed to be an odd number, uh, but uh, in K fold, uh, I don't think uh, K is uh, even uh, will cause a problem. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Now I call upon paper ID 33 to present hyperparameter optimization of convolutional neural networks for breast cancer classification. Please note that it will be a 10 minute presentation. PPT. This folder, which I see it. Good afternoon. Respected session chairs and uh, all the entire team of this conference, ICA WC 2021. One second, slide show. Slideshow. Present here. Is it online? No, no. Soft. Okay. I welcome all of you to my presentation. And uh, myself, Srikala KK. Uh, I'm research scholar of IIIT Kota. I am I'm, I'm taking this opportunity to express my sincere thanks to my uh, guide, Dr. J. Krishna Sahu, and my mentor, uh, Mr. Pradeep Kumar P., and also the uh, entire team of, uh, especially the organizer of this uh, mega event for uh, giving me a chance to participate in this uh, mega event, and also to present my purpose, my research work here. And my presentation is based on the uh, based on my research work that is a hyperparameter optimization of convolutional neural network for breast cancer classification. These are the contents we are going to discuss with, and what is abstract. The model that we are uh, proposed to have the major challenges and motivation are the irrelevant data and improper hyperparameters can lead to misclassification and designing a model uh, which, which may give much efficiency, improvement in efficiency of the neural network by optimizing the hyperparameters. The data set used is inverse database. 
and uh, the importance or significance of methods are we have to do pre-processing, we have to uh, select the neuron activation function, and also the uh, fine-tuning of hyperparameters. The performance measured is like this, introduction. So as we all know, breast cancer is a very invasive type of cancer that affect the women in between the age of 40 and 55. And what is challenging is that the health worker is uh, most of the time they are, uh, they are in a challenge to diagnose it properly. Then uh, if, if it is possible to provide a computer aided uh, de uh, decision tool, it will be more uh, easy and convenient to uh, predict or diagnose the breast cancer in an easy way. And uh, we know uh, there are many modalities for uh, screening the breast cancer. Uh, breast cancer. Uh, of these, uh, some major important modalities are uh, mammography, MRI, and ultrasound scan. Of these, uh, mammography is an efficient tool because of its uh, economic feasibility also. And uh, furtherly, uh, the deep learning become, uh, plays a major role uh, in uh, imitating or it is uh, it, like a human brain. Uh, it uh, observe, analyze and learn human behavior and uh, make decision. decision. Uh, we can propose a decision-making tool uh, to solve all these problems. Many studies or research work have been proposed in recent years using heuristic algorithms to solve CNN hyperparameter optimization problem. And the literature survey. The, uh, literature, the research work proposed by Ramos and team uh, suggested an effective method for precise use of optimizing algorithm for the biomedical application of CNN. The method starts with an established deep neural network architecture and tunes to produce uh, a high result uh, with a hyperparameter tuning. It gives a better accuracy. And another work uh, um, proposed by Eng and team uh, proposes a uh, model, multi-node evolutionary neural network for deep learning, M-E-N-N-D-L, which, uh, which gives a, a high accuracy, but it uh, gives a, it uh, put forward a challenge that for the design of a fixed layer is that models made too insignificant for the problem and cause great bias. The system may become biased. Literature uh, survey continued. Uh, the, uh, another work uh, put forward by Masni and team uh, is based on the ROI, region of interest. And they, uh, they named their uh, model as YOLO. You, uh, it means you uh, only look once. It uh, follows the following steps, that is pre-processing, feature extraction, mass detection, and also mass classification. The proposed uh, model have great accuracy. And our proposed methodology uh, undergoes these following steps. We are using the inverse data set, and we have to uh, follow up the pre-processing. The pre-processing techniques that we are used are normalization and standardization. And uh, next, we have to go to the classification. Uh, and before classifying or learning the algorithm, uh, we have to perform hyperparameter optimization. The hyperparameter optimization techniques that we used are grid search and random search techniques. And again, we come to the uh, steps of uh, our proposal system in detail. Data description, the uh, inverse database is used. It's a publicly available data set. It contains 115 cases with uh, 410 images. And it, uh, it's of uh, corneal cardial and uh, med uh, medial lateral oblique MLQ, MLO views. And it's, it is based on the standards of BA RATS. It's some image, uh, some benign and mal malignant images. Benign mass means it is not invasive, but malignant needs more treatment uh, that is it is invasive. Steps for proposed methodology. First, we have to perform pre-processing, the pre-process, and then next we have to tune the hyperparameter to get a uh, highly uh, dependable uh, configuration for the hyperparameter. And, uh, uh, 
and we have to do classification. Data pre-processing process. Without a uh, pre-processing, the data may be uh, may, may not get give a good result. So we have to do pre-processing technique using normalization and standardization. Normalization fixes the data in between uh, in a particular range that is zero and one, and uh, it eliminates the redundancy in data. Also, standardization is uh, we know the data have two quantities that is the original value and its unit. Maybe the units may be in different different. Say height have meter, centimeter, and like that, and weight have meet, gram, kilogram, etc. We have to put all these uh, you. Uh, all this unit uh, in, into a same unit, then only the uh, model will give correct result. That for that purpose, we have to perform standardization. Then classification model. We are performing- uh, Two we are, more minutes. Okay, uh, convolution neural network we are um, using because of its part, um, peculiar characteristics of extracting features from directly from the images. Okay, this is the architecture of CNN. I think it's uh, visible to you. Input layer is there, convolution layer, then a final layer is fully connected layer and it, uh, it will predict the output as, uh, since we are using a binary classification, it will give uh, benign or malignant successfully. And we have to do hyperparameter optimization also. Hyperparameter optimization or tuning is the problem of choosing a set of optimal hyperparameter value for the learning algorithm. Several algorithms are using for a hyperparameter optimization. Uh, and the important two are grid search and random search. These are some of the hyperparameters that are used with the different uh, models and performance evaluation. We have, uh, uh, we, uh, we proposed here uh, the performance with and without pre-processing and with the, the grid search and random search. Without pre-processing, CNN performs this much. GS means uh, grid search with the CNN and RS means random search with the CNN and both the GS and the C, uh, RS with the CNN performs a, uh, have a highly uh, perform, high performance and with the pre-processing the entire dimension is changed that the GSR CNN gives a uh, very good result with a 98.6 accuracy and we uh, conducted an experiment uh, with uh, the data set uh, publicly available inverse and we got uh, the ROC curve like this and the performance uh, CNN model accuracy and the loss uh, in each epoch. As the epoch rate increases, the accuracy also increases and uh, epoch rate increases, the loss become decreases. Conclusion. In this paper, we classify the breast cancer as benign or malignant using the deep learning method of CNN. For uh, we use a pre-processing uh, pre-processing the data using the normalization and standardization method. And uh, uh, we um, conduct feature selection uh, and uh, the classification accuracy of the model is improved by optimizing the hyperparameters of deep, deep neural network. Hyperparameter optimization for hyperparameter op optimization, we use the technique of grid search and random search method and uh, a simulation experiment is conducted, which have the accuracy of 98.66 achieved. The proposed methodology, methodology can be able to detect the breast cancer in sig significantly. These are some of the reference papers I have. Thank you. Can you show that uh, performance evaluation screen? Sure, ma'am. This one? This no. One? Uh, with or with them? Okay. This is with the preprocess. Okay. Uh, from this, uh, which uh, how you are going to consider which one is best? As you have listed out the uh, precision that uh, uh, which one is a recall? Which one is recall sensitivity or specificity? I didn't get you, ma'am. Which precision, one? sensitivity, specificity. Ah, okay. Uh, that, that is a repeating the 
One is repeating that. Can you Six. identify that? Uh, recall with the sensitivity or specificity. Ah, uh, that is uh, this uh, metric. Oh, are... The same for one. Accuracy. No. No, I did. We can check with whether uh, uh, is there anything it's uh, similar to the, having sensitivity or specificity. Sensitivity is uh, uh, that is uh, uh, true positive, and specificity is uh, false positive. Recall. Uh, recall is one by that is uh, then some, precision. Precision. Uh, there is also that is question. repeating. That's oh. all. There is no need of not precision. Ah, oh. uh, um, recall is you can put it in a bracket. Ah, okay. okay, you have to make it clear. This, I am putting. Uh, uh, you have listed all these uh, performance measures or metrics. How you can make a conclusion on which one is best? They, uh, because you have listed all these things together. Okay, best one is uh, GSRSENN. How, that uh, means performing uh, the research and the random search in CNN. For uh, hyperparameter tuning. Back, back. The same, same slide. Oh, so, so. Oh, okay. Hmm. So, which, which metrics you will give more priority uh, to uh, choose a model? Uh, um, because of accuracy. Is it a combination of a precision or recall or sensitivity specificity or F measure or standalone accuracy? As far as considering CNN, accuracy is much important. But we have to stick, we have to avoid uh, the uh, 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 false negative. Uh, false positive is, uh, it may be acceptable, but false uh, true, uh, I mean, um, uh, false, uh, false negative that will uh, that will uh, cause high. That should be avoided. So more than accuracy, that term should be uh, specified. Specific yes. in CNN as far as considering CNN. Or CNN or your application. Uh, most of the time, uh, CNN. It's based is... upon your application. Something no, has no, to be. It should be avoided because uh, uh, anybody in false uh, prediction. Uh, they may get their own. It is based upon the intensity of the application. If it is wrongly classified, that something is um, um, uh, false and wrongly classified, uh, based upon the application's intensity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that may have to pay most. Okay, um, I'm not getting the point of a hyperparameter optimization which uh, you have introduced here. Your highlight of the topic is uh, you have introduced a hyperparameter hyperparameter optimization in CNN. Mm -hmm. So can you make it more clear? Ah, yeah, uh, hyperparameter optimization techniques. Actually, we have two types of parameters, model parameters and hyperparameters. Model parameters uh, we can access from uh, learning, uh, learning the uh, model. But uh, the performance of, uh, of Actually, we are making a model to uh, get CNN there. itself can be act as an unsupervised. Uh, no okay. need of learning is the uh, uh, CNN is uh, used for uh, image. I mean, extracting the features from uh, the image because it's the a image. characteristic. It's a special uh, yeah. um, temporal okay. act, action can be implemented. Implemented. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, hyperparameter uh, also decides the performance of the model. Uh, some other, um, they, they are uh, given by uh, trial and error method usually. But if there is an algorithm, there is a method uh, we can have to get a high uh, uh, performing configuration. And we know uh, according to the data, the model will be changed. And also- Can you list out uh, that type of parameter in your application? Uh, I'm uh, doing, um, make, uh, I made an algorithm like this. First of all, I have to perform a uh, random search in order to uh, 
in order to skip some uh, combinations, permutations and combinations. And uh, uh, after getting the output from the uh, randomly searched result, the best for performance, I did perform the grid set so that uh, each and every one is performed to get the uh, best. What is the size of the grid? A grid uh, that I'm tried with the many. Uh, is this an overlapping grid or a normal simply uh, divide it into a certain size of grids? Uh, it's a, a particular That's size. A sliding, I... sliding grid or a normal grid? Sliding. Skipping. Because it's an image. Uh, yeah. So we have mm -hmm. a thorough look into each pixels. Yeah. Uh, I, first thing, first level, I perform a random search so that some will be skipped there. Just, just continue with the random search, random search algorithm. It's a budget is fixed and uh, do some uh, searching operation, random search operation. The result of that random search is uh, performed with the grid set, analyzed each and every uh, uh, search area, and we get the best performing area. And, and do that's this. what I'm asking. What is the size of the grid? Uh, uh, that I did, Have you uh, come across with the best grid? Uh, uh, with the, the experiment, I think uh, it's your uh, experiment done on the size of the grid. I uh, say um, the three by three like that, and uh, it's sixty-four times repeated. Okay, not sliding. Not uh, and it is uh, uh, repeating. Okay. Mm. So it is uh, three by three is good for. Yeah, uh, uh, okay, I'm you try out for three by three, five by five. I am. Like, and uh, okay, uh, make okay. a conclusion which grid is the best. Um, most uh, uh, normally all of them are taken the three by three. That's normally, what. Uh, three by three. Okay, I got better better result with the three by three because of much uh, computation complexity is less and also. Um, uh, Think about that whether it is good for five by five because the complexity of the time complexity can be reduced and yeah. if it is not having the three by three or five by five uh, work comes the that there are also a so, lot of factors are the size mm. size yeah. of the uh, looking um, looking area yeah, yeah. And, And uh, optimization. What uh, what optimization you have taken? Ah, both optimization, grid search, and uh, random optimization search method. Optimization method, mm -hmm. uh, uh, grid search, and uh, random search optimization techniques are implemented. Through that, I get a new model uh, which can perform better. Each time it is changing, most pro, uh, most of the time it performs well with the, the three by three combination. And according to the data change, it may change also. I'm uh, doing the experiment continuously. And planning to implement the uh, Bayesian optimization. Bob, B -O -H -E that's what I'm asking, uh, which optimization? Because uh, gridding all this is not an optimization. Uh, uh, BOHP is under uh, experiment. My uh, under my research work. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you all for uh, patient listening. Next, I call upon paper ID 21 to present learning to play football using distributional reinforcement learning and depth wise separation, separable convolutional feature extraction. It is an online presentation.
is it audible hello uh, aniruddha datta Aniruddha Dutta. You can start your presentation. Hello, am I audible? Yes, you're audible. Yes, yes. Is the baby visible? Yes, it is. I'm very sorry for the delay because I was going through a browser and the browser is creating some issues. So uh, uh, let's, without, without any further ado, we'll start with the PPT. Uh, so the it's a 10 minute presentation. 
Okay, okay, cool. So uh, let's start with the topic. Learning to play football using distributional reinforcement learning and depth first convolution. Now, why we are trying to learn football using AI is because the first thing that we are trying to teach is uh, teach AI is to do general tasks every day, uh, general complex tasks. But each complex task, like self-driving cars, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and industrial uh, industrial heavyweight lifting, etc., comes with some risks. But some sports and games and video games they do not come with the associated risk of uh, losing lives or losing uh, uh, losing property, etc. So it's a very safe way of trying to teach complex tasks to uh, AI agents and through distributional deep reinforcement learning and depth first convolution. As we'll go for the next slides. So the discussion points. Discussion points are introduction, the motivation of our work, depth first convolution, distribution model, and results. In conclusion, so with the introduction. We'd like to emphasize that we have focused on efficiency gains and performance gains for football playing agents for Google Research Football Environment, which is a uh, which is a free environment which is available on GitHub and it was used in many different comp uh, competitions like Kaggle and also their research work. In our work, we have used QRDQN, which is a short of quantum regression uh, DQN, that is deep Q networks, and PPA agents, which is the short form of proximal policy agents, proximal policy optimization agents which were examined to demonstrate the difference between policy gradient RL and distribution RL. There are a few key differences which we'll, be, uh, uh, which we'll be discussing in the next few slides. And as we all know, this deep reinforcement learning is used to perform reinforcement learning through deep neural networks, as the name suggests, deep reinforcement learning. So the feature structure varies according to the task. So in this case, we our task was to take four separate channels of information and hence, we used the feature extractor of deep depth-wise reinforcement learning, depth-wise uh, convolution. And there were several experiments performed using stable baselines three and stable baselines three contrib in Kaggle platform because we lack uh, GPU resources. And isolated experiments for the ablation studies of the feature extractors, algorithms, and the number of quantiles, the effects of them, and the performances were uh, carried out in our work. So the primary motivation is to get state-of-the-art results within uh, within within a reliable number, sorry, within a reasonable number of steps. As we can see in the original paper of the Google Research Football, it took 500 million steps, which basically is synonymous to, it is synonymous to hexa-core Intel Xeon W2134 CPU with 3.70 gigahertz and 512 GB RAM maximum and concurrently running 10 environments with 20 to 140 million steps per day. That is the equivalent of 500 million steps. So as you can see, they're working on a huge budget as compared to the, uh, almost any institution in India. I guess uh, only IIT Bombay, I guess, has this kinds of funding for their AI research. But our budget in a normal uh, BTEC project or a BTEC level budget was just a dual core Intel Xeon CPU at 2.3 gigahertz and one Tesla P100 16 GB VRAM GPU. So uh, my main motivation was to find a certain way that I can leverage this meager uh, budget to my advantage. So first of all, in the original paper, they used normal residual uh, connections, which is a uh, very famous, very, very famous architecture for Impala. But here uh, we did a bit of research and we found out that each channel did not have an RGB component or a black and white component like in normal images, but it had separate information. There were 16 channels out of 12 channels were zero paddings and four channels only had information. So for that, the best way to separate out the convolution and thus reduce the parameters and thus reduce compute is depth first convolution. As we know, depth first convolution is just convolutions along the channels and separated out, which reduces the number of parameters, as we all know, because convolution requires the 2n plus 1 parameters for each dimension. And if we reduce the dimension, we uh, scale multiplicatively, scale down multiplicatively. And then we have a point plus convolution. So this was the main gist of our feature ex extractor that was used for the environment as the inf interface to the environment. As I said, we use the simplified minimap version of the Google Football Analyzer. There are many versions. There is the simple pixelated version, simplified minimap. There is raw information, and there is the 115 vector uh, uh, vector in, um, mode. We use the simplified minimap version, which is just a uh, short, I mean, the condensed version of pixels in dots and lines where the players play football with using uh, the position of other players in simple dots and lines. As I said, there were four channels. The first plane or the first channel. First and second plane consider continuous state of position of left and right, respectively, your team and my team. That is the rival's team and my team. And third plane is formation of the ball position. And fourth plane is the active player. 
So there were four channels of information and that's why we use depth first convolution. Now going, moving on to distributional reinforcement learning. Just a little bit of introduction before I use, I say why I use distributional reinforcement learning. We have the very well-known Bellman operator. It is a recursive operator of updating the Q value in the reinforcement learning setup. Q value being the return or the rewards. And the distributional Bellman operator differs from the normal Q value. As we can see that you have removed the expectation sign. Now, what that, that, does that mean? We're not taking a mean anymore. We're taking the whole reward, whole return over the all course of action. So, and the next part of that is the quantile regression DQN. We all know that regression plays a huge role in reinforcement learning or any kind of machine learning, uh, machine learning aspect. If you want to pinpoint to any value or want to predict any value, we use regression. So same idea is used here. We predict the quantiles, the position of the quantiles using quantile regression. And for that, we don't use the mean square error loss, but we use a quantile Huber loss. And the quantile Huber loss is simple. As we can see that the loss is just parabolic within a certain range, that is kappa. If the, uh, if the loss is within, uh, if the distribution is within a certain range of kappa, we, it's a parabolic uh, distribution. And if it's within outside that range, it's a linear distribution. So it just is a simplified, uh, simplified uh, mean square error loss. And finally, we can summarize QRD with the Bellman operator, where the distribution Z is being re, uh, recursively updated using the uh, states, which take a probability of action, which maximizes the reward, signified by the R max. Now coming to the main difference between the DQN C51 and QRDQN. C51 start, stands for categorical 51, which is an earlier version of distributional reinforcement learning, which is uh, also, also uh, started by Will Dabney and QRDQN is also uh, authored by Will Dabney. As we can see, DQN focuses only on the returns point-wise, C51 goes for the distribution of the return uh, probability wise, but the probability probability is different, but the quantiles are fixed in C51. So the position of the quantile, the, 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 the distribution cannot move around in the uh, return space. And we can see that QRD when, although it is uniform distribution, the quantiles can move around. As you can see for action number one, two, three, four, suppose we have action number one, two, three, four, and we have returns, the quantiles are moving around actually. So that is a success of QRD QN above C51 instead of fixed quantiles, we are using moving quantiles. So moving on to the results of our experiments, we carried out four experiments. We'll go, go uh, throughout them, uh, through them subsequently. Let me just move it here. Is the whole uh, results visible? Excuse me? Yes, it is visible. Okay. So as we can see, the residual connections, we recreated the uh, recreated the experiment that is done by the original research. And we found that the residual connections for PPO, which is the representative of the normal reinforcement and which is based on policy gradient, severely underperforms the depth-wise convolution, convolutions. We can see the depth-wise convolution. Uh, the table is for testing results and the, uh, and the diagrams are for training results. We can see for PPO, there is a huge difference in the the blue signifying a difference that the first the red ones are residual conditions. There is a huge difference in, during the training phase, as you can see. And during the testing phase also, there is a huge difference. Whereas in we see that there is a uh, similarity in the performance in both future extractors. So since there's a huge market difference between the depth-wise convolution and the residual convolution, we have continued to in our subsequent experiments. For the second experiment, we fitted the algorithms against each other. PPO versus QRD in all scenarios. Uh, it's it's uh, useful to mention here that we used, we have different scenarios of different difficulties where we have easy, medium, and hard difficulty for the uh, for the football game. We can see that in easy, easy uh, environment, PPO outperforms QRD QN, though not by a very huge margin, but we can see that QRD QN struggles a bit while training. And also, uh, it is important to note that QRDP is an off-policy algorithm, so the uh, so the performance is not uh, not uh, descriptive of what is tested out uh, tested later on due to the replay buffer. Um, but as we go on increasing in difficulty, BPO fails to generalize the performance it shows during the easy performance, easy uh, easy environment. As you can see, there is a huge difference for medium and hard for PPO, but QRDQ actually is much better than PPO for the medium and uh, medium and hard scenarios, showing that the distributional property of QRDQN improves generalization at difficult uh, levels. 
we have summarized the table as the uh, as a uh, bar graph as well. As you can see, the PPO outperforms QRDP in the easier easier environment, but QRDP outperforms PPO in the harder environments. PPO in darker gray and QRDP in lighter gray. And you can also see the standard deviation of PPO is very high as compared to uh, QRDP, also showing more stability. Now we try to do, uh, try to do the ablation studies of a number of quantiles. So the number of quantiles can be anything. The default is 200. So we tried to decrease the number of quantiles and uh, the increase the number of quantiles, showing the uh, showing density of the uh, density of distribution. As you can see, is it visible? Two more minutes. Okay. So uh, we, we can see that the 100 quantiles obviously makes it much less stable and it out, uh, 200 quantiles outperforms. And 400 quantiles, it makes it much more stable than 200 compounds, uh, uh, quantiles. So we can see that there is an increase in stability while increase in the quantiles. And uh, we have the summar uh, summarization of the table. As you can see, the performance increases gradually as we increase the quantiles. Unfortunately, for the 400 quantiles, the increase was not as high as the uh, 200 quantiles. And finally, we have the academic scenarios where you do, where you train the agent to play repetitive tasks like shooting from a shooting from a, a distance, shooting from the close range, three versus one, et cetera. And there are nine different tasks. And the 10th task is playing against lazy, uh, lazy opponents, which was kind of repetitive, so we did not repeat the experiment. So as we can see, we have broken few benchmarks using PPO, using depth-wise convolution as compared to ResNet, uh, ResNet or residual convolution. We have uh, not by a huge margin in the first, two uh, first three tasks, but by a huge margin, in uh, later on tasks, as you can see, the yellow being our experiment and the uh, green being their experiment, the bar graphs, we can see that there is a huge difference in the benchmark performance and our performance. And we also compared QRD with the QRD with the other off-policy algorithm in their paper that is Impala, Importance Weighted Actor Learner, Weighted Architecture, which is, uh, we did not pit the off-policy within against on-policy and on-policy against off-policy because there might be some undue advantages that on-policy has which is shown in the results because on policy discards all the memory that it gains while interacting with the environment and off policy off policy might have have issues with uh, performing repetitive tasks because of the replay buffer being filled with repetitive uh, and similar memory that is memory of being of the sarsa tuple that is the state action reward and next state action reward so coming to the conclusion we see promising results in goal difference we broke benchmarks using depth first convolution for the academic scenario, analyze the performance of a number of quantiles. Limitation to this method is uniform distribution of QRD, which needs to be varied. And in the future work, we're trying to do it IQN. As we know that it takes the, the training time requires a lot of uh, training, requires a lot of time. Our, we did training for 3 million and 6 million steps. 6 million steps took uh, almost 24 hours of training. 3 million steps took 12 hours of training. So it's a time intensive process and we're going for the future work. Thank you. And I'd like some questions, please. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, yes. In your particular architecture, how you are giving this a reward, the be better reward as compared to other uh, methods? Uh, excuse me. I as, it is a, as it is a reinforcement learning and we have to move, uh, yes, you are reducing the number of steps involved in this particular architecture and hardware, uh, the reward processing. What is the policy that you followed for giving the rewards? Ma'am, the policy for the QRD given? Uh, at, uh, on each moment, uh, we have to choose, uh, we have to give a reward and based upon that reward, we are yes, yes, yes. taking the yes. next. Yes, the reward. Uh, sorry, I forgot to mention that the reward is pre-designed by GRF, uh, that is uh, Google Research Football. The reward that the set for competitions and uh, and uh, different research purposes uh, was one plus one for a goal and a proportional reward for going across the field. Many researchers use uh, extra rewards for suppose an extra action. Out of the nineteen actions, they choose pass uh, to pass action or kick action to uh, have a higher reward. But one of our one of the other motivations was to get state of the art performance without increasing the reward in any way, and so we did not add anything to the reward, and we kept the reward as as the uh, given function. 
since the reward is very simple, that is plus one for a goal and um, plus one for a goal and proportional increase in the reward. Suppose uh, we cover half of the field, you will get 0.5 reward, and we do not include in the PPD. Uh, there are different complex rewards as well. We do not do that because uh, there is a line of research which says that almost goes towards reward free reinforcement learning or as simple rewards or as delayed. Uh, delayed gratification or de delayed returns as possible. So we try to go on that with the original reward that is there. Uh, is the answer satisfactory? Yes, yes. Uh, how much um, performance improvement that you have seen based upon a normal architecture, normal hardware arch architecture? Yes, ma'am. So uh, with the normal hardware, as you can see with the experiment for academic scenarios, this is the, uh, I guess this is the best uh, way to compare it because the earlier as I said, it takes 500 million steps. There is no, there is almost, uh, there is almost an impossibility to reproduce the results of the uh, original researchers without that kind of a, or even like a quarter or a fraction of their uh, resources. But the academic scenarios are very easy to train. They take less time to train. So we can see a huge numerical difference. As you can see with, uh, suppose, let's take a market difference of action number three which I guess was taking a penalty score or a three versus one scenario. That's not important, but we can see a performance difference of compared to 0. Point, almost 0. 0.5 to almost 0. 0.9. So a 0. 0.4 difference. And taking the next action, action number four, for depth wise, we can see it's almost a 0. 0.8 compared to 0. 0.75, a 0. 0.5 difference. So there is a, according to different tasks, there is a, a huge difference and the numerical uh, differences are being uh, shown in this bar graph and also we can see the we can see the training difference for the ResNet the normal architecture okay, uh, okay. we reproduce the results in a normal uh, uh, neural okay. network architecture my next and also the hardware is, architecture my next question is uh, uh, as you are um, uh, making this for a normal architecture what's the size of your that is a space complexity uh, is it uh, affecting that Yes, yes, yes. The, the, the RAM is affecting very much in the replay buffer size. As you, uh, if you re refer my paper, and I do not include it in the PPD because of the time, but the space of the replay buffer depends heavily on the RAM. So apparently the time complexity also going to be affected? Sorry, ma'am? I think so. Time complexity also affected? Uh, ma'am, you're not audible for a minute. I'm sorry. Time Please. complexity. Space uh, the size complexity already affected. Uh, time, time, time. Yes, yes. The complexity is very affected, ma'am. Actually, we had to suffer through a lot of this because, uh, as we, as you know, we were, we are beginners and we don't know a lot of things, and okay. we okay. actually don't know, don't did not know that RAM affects the buff, replay buffer size. For a normal standard 10 to the power six replay buffer, it requires more than 16 GB of RAM. But oh. as you know, in if you use Kaggle, you, you, some of the uh, G, uh, RAM is used up to make space for the GPU. So that 12 G, 16 GB RAM is dropped to 12 GB or 14 GB as per the GPU size. So we did not know what was happening and we're facing errors with off-policy reinforcement learning uh, algorithms, not just QRDQN, DQN as, as well. And we uh, did some research, it was a learning process for us. And we realized that we have to reduce the replay buffer and the sample complexity has also um, reduced for that. We have to use a 10 to the power four replay buffer. So which basically meant that we did not have a very, we did not have a very robust uh, sample size of the replay buffer, uh, replay buffer to sample actions from. If we, okay. if we would have okay. more resources, we could have taken 10 to the power six, 10 to the power eight, even 10 to the power twelve, which is a normal, uh, which is a normal scaling in done in uh, higher, uh, highly funded research uh, centers. <clears throat> Mostly, if you see in uh, SSC research papers, as such as that they are doing 10 to the power eight, 10 to the power twelve, also in also, um, I guess, uh, of policy. Offline learning, offline reinforcement learning, they're doing a much larger replay buffer size. That is two, two into 10 to the power eight, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, it obviously gets affected with the sample complexity. As you can see that sample complexity, you can see the effect in that. You can verily see the effect in that by the dips in the performance of QRDQ. Okay. Ma'am, is it visible? Yes, yes, yes. yes. As is you can see, and there is a peak okay. and a trough. Uh, there's a peak and a trough almost successively. You can see that this is the effect of having a small replay buffer because when the experiences get over, there is no more uh, reward maximization. There is a new set of experiences, and since of the new set, of, because of the new set of experiences, the performance drops drastically. So we 
even even through that we saw improvements in performances so we are hopeful that a larger if never for sometime in the future would uh, improve the performance okay thank you okay ma'am is that all yes yes thank you ma'am next i call upon paper id 25 to present real time static and dynamic hand gestures cognized for human computer interaction it's a 10 minute presentation Start. Good afternoon, everyone, uh, respected session chair, respected faculties, and uh, participants. Uh, myself, I'm Ajit Jacob. I'm an assistant professor in Quantum Institute of Technology, and my paper is on real-time static and dynamic hand gestures cognizant for human-computer in interaction. And this paper is on human-computer interaction, and also mainly I focus on the subpart of the human-computer interaction that is hand gestures. We all know that the hand gestures having Uh, more advantages than other conventional devices, and also it really helps to communicate with the end users. And uh, hand gestures they take uh, take uh, uh, take visual input like photos and videos, and they compute and and get uh, compute and get the output from that one. And static and dynamic gesture, uh, dynamic hand gesture will uh, will improve. We uh, we can communicate in natural and intuitive ways. uh two types of hand gestures are there static and dynamic static means uh static which is uh, which is doesn't have any movement that's like uh, okay victory and all and dynamic which have the hand gesture which have a movement and uh straightly moving to the literature review the literature review is uh, divided into three parts static uh, hand gestures paper and the dynamic hand gestures paper and and the last one is both of static and dynamic uh while we searching we can get to so many of papers that uh, depends on hand gestures but they are exclusively on static or dynamic there is less papers which uh, gives uh, both of static and dynamic hand gestures uh, first i move to the uh, static hand gestures review and there is two i take took two papers and first one uh, using kemin uh, based uh, kemin based they extract the size and correlation of the hand and the second one uh, using svm where they extract the uh, skin color of the uh, and also the size and orientation using svm uh, method and uh, moving to the next part of the dynamic hand gestures in dynamic the first one they uh, 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 extract the trajectory using the trajectory they can uh, detect the movement of the hand the second one also same as the trajectory is using with the help of bayesian network and the last one i selected um, uh, two pa one paper which are which uh, combines to have static and dynamic they used kinetic sensor for detecting the uh, movements of the hand and this is very cost effective uh, paper and moving on to the my proposed system architecture in this i uh, developed a system which which combines static and dynamic with the help of low cost camera and i uh, the whole system has contains of three uh, three set of algorithm and first one is hand area detection second one feature extraction third one is gesture recognition for hand area detection i uh, for in, in hand area detection the main agenda is to uh, reduce uh, the background of or the subtracting the background of the hand we only need the part of the hand or only Uh, the area of the uh, hand uh, we doesn't need the background so in hand area detection we are subtracting or uh, subtracting the background using uh, first we uh, capture a picture uh, and then we select a range of minimum and maximum of rgb inside the hand and uh, this type we uh, we uh, capture a picture and we select an rgb range uh, of that particular hand area uh, minimum and maximum of rgb range inside the hand and then we transfer it to a euclidean filter and euclidean filter uh, there is uh, they filters the pixels which is inside the rgb range to a color of white and other uh, outside of the rgb they subtract everyone using uh, black pixels and then again convert it to a red and black pixel uh, red and black image so that uh, hand hand part becomes red skin part becomes uh, red and other background becomes black black we can uh, show it in the figure this is the red and black image and from that 
image we select a blob we when we convert it to a uh, red and black image we have so much of blob uh, maybe a chance of other things which is in the figure uh, which comes in the range of rgb of hand or, and so we get so many blobs so we have to select a one blob uh, so we select the large blob unfortunately when we take a photo the hand will be the uh, last blob in that image and that blob is carried to another section that is feature extraction we have two types of hand gestures already said for uh, that is static hand gesture in static uh, we use three steps mainly contour extraction convexity hull and uh, convex hull and convexity effects uh, contour extraction means that we are extracting the pixels of the boundary uh, of the hand uh, in contour extraction uh, uh, there is two uh, there is one algorithm used uh, that, that algorithm has two parts first we select the pixel and we place in image dot pixel uh, list and that pixel is again checked with the surrounding pixel if so all the surrounding pixels are red in color that means that that pixel is inside the hand if any one of the pixel is in black in color that means that pixel is in the boundary and we uh, select that uh, pixel and store in another list called contour and that is using the function get contour function and we drawing a line using library using system dot drawing dot imaging and uh, this is the algorithm and uh, uh, next that contour list is transferred to next session that is convex cell in convex cell they selecting the edges of that figures it just means the highest point uh, there is a list in contour uh, or the pixel boundary pixel that pixel is transferred to uh, another list name hull dot hull finder dot find hull in that uh, con uh, list they select the edges that means the highest point of that uh, uh, that uh, that picture uh, and they connecting a, a polygon a drawing a polygon which connecting all the uh, that edges we can see on the figure that uh, they are connecting to the all the uh, edges and they drawn a polygon using uh, drawing dot polygon function and also uh, we used the ground convex hull for the storing of uh, this uh, co convex hull uh, function and that uh, convex hull is next transferred to convexity defects. In convexity defects, we know that in the figure of convex hull, we know that some part is unwanted parts, that between the hand, there is unwanted parts. So, so we select the convexity defect uh, with checking the depth of the depth of the uh, edge and uh, depth of the edge. Uh, and uh, using convexity defect, we calculate the finger. If there is three convexity defect, we will have four fingers. If only two convexity defects, we have two fingers. Convexity defect plus one is the finger count we used for uh, for the process. And uh, setting apart all the static hand uh, the hand gestures, and we moving to the next uh, part is dynamic hand gestures. In this, uh, we setting the image to uh, or screen to x axis and y axis, and we selecting the blob center axis SC and YC. From the center, uh, the blob center movement, we uh, checking whether the, how, where the movement of the hand using the center of the uh, blob, we check whether it's moving to the right side or left side, uh, or, or and also we use a shape checker like the triangle or quadrilateral uh, using the center of the uh, blob. Uh, while I draw in, uh, in a triangle, uh, triangle, then we need to detect it as a triangle or it's a quadrilateral. Uh, dynamic hand gesture is used using the center of the uh, blob, and this is a, a blob. And uh, this is uh, one image, uh, screenshot of the triangle. The triangle is detected. I'll show the uh, gesture uh, output in the next slide. Uh, two hand detection is same as the static detection. Only difference is that they select two blob. And, uh, so, and also by other, uh, the same as the static uh, hand gesture that convex cell, convex cell defect and, and contour extraction as doing in uh, the two hand. But other difference between static is that they select two. In static hand gesture, only, only one blob is selected. And the moving to the gesture recognition, static gesture has uh, we uh, implemented two uh, gestures. One is finger count and common gesture. Uh, we can see in the figure, finger count is equal to convexity defect plus one. Uh, when uh, you can see in the finger count two, and uh, uh, when I use four fingers, they show. Actually, uh, the four four is showing, and five finger five finger count is showing. And next, moving to the common gestures that we used, uh, uh, that victory, letter Y, complete hand, I love you. And uh, for that, we used a finger count and aspect ratio. For victory and letter Y, we, we used two finger counts. So there is a confusion in system, how to detect this. Another one having five and three uh, finger count. Uh, victory and letter Y having uh, two 
finger count. So we used aspect ratio height versus width. Uh, let victory house aspect ratio less than one, and because our width is small and Two more uh, uh, high, height is small, and when uh, for uh, second the letter y have uh, letter y is like this, and that aspect ratio is more than one, and we can see there uh, victory uh, and. Uh, it's complete hand is showing. Complete hand. And next, I'm moving to the dynamic hand gestures. I already explained that x axis and y axis is used. Uh, the movement moving up, moving down is showing. Mm. Left and right. And uh, shape checking. In that, uh, I drawn a uh, quadrilateral. Uh, and this side, we can see that they detected a quadrilateral after drawing. Then I draw a triangle, they detect a triangle. And uh, uh, two hand detection, we can see that fingers, six fingers are they detecting. Two blobs are using for extraction. Six fingers are detecting. And the last, I developed two applications. One, audio player using a static hand gesture. Uh, if there is a sound, we can see the sound, can hear the sound. Uh, and also video player using uh, dynamic hand gestures. I uh, developed two applications and moving to the experiments. Uh, we used three types of room, three lighting of rooms, dark room, medium room, and light room. And we used different two kinds of hands, uh, which uh, darker and light hand, uh, light color hand. If uh, my hand is dark and while others are, I used light hand. Uh, my good combination is dark room and light hand. We get a more appropriate uh, speed uh, results are coming. Uh, light room and light color hand is very difficult to get a good result. And also that same thing I've done in dynamic also, light hand uh, and uh, dark three types of rooms are done. And we get a result of uh, almost uh, two uh, seconds of average result. And uh, I already said that dark room and light color hand is more a uh, better one. And uh, so the performance evaluation and the conclusion, the research presents uh, interpretation of both dynamic and stand, uh, the static gestures. And uh, we, get a, we get a low cost effective hardware. And also we are not that we are living in that disability world you say because of the COVID, uh, this type of uh, hand gesture software will be helping for the future. Thank you. What is the range of that uh, RGB values to identify the skin color? Actually, we are uh, extracting the range of uh, lighting using uh, minimum and maximum range. And we get a radius of RGB sphere. So we have to extract that area only which is less than that color. Uh, we are subtracting that. Uh, 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 subtracting. Is it that you are considering only R, G, and B standalone for finding that uh, boundary? Mm. Actually, uh, we use. That is not possible. That's what I'm asking. Okay. Actually, uh, we are done using an input uh, function. I think all production. these things are done based upon some tool, the help of a tool. Yeah, yeah. We done using an input which function, tool? which uh, Visual Media, uh, Visual Studio, then, and with the help of. Uh, uh, because there is C no learning or classification or nothing has happened. Learning have have you done any learning here? Uh, actually, we done uh, that uh, hand gestures learning. Uh, then we implement. The, How you uh, make the machine learn about uh, what is the same? One, two, why, and the um, the gestures that are um, asked you in form uh, a display. Uh, actually, they are learning using conversity defects. If there is one conversity defect, that means that two fingers are there. If there is uh, two uh, conversity defects, if there is three fingers are there. So using that uh, uh, machine is learning. Actually, they are drawing the figures. Um, have you came, came across with a background that having this type of uh, this? Uh, color similar to uh, uh, and skin. It's very difficult to, uh, that's why RGB, I, I already told that there are one or more blobs there. When I setting a minimum and maximum range, maybe a chances of getting more blobs in there. So uh, okay. hand is very near to uh, the camera. This will be a large blob. Uh, so have you try, a, a try with the various color range? Scheme? Yeah, yeah, we tried with various all, color. All are accepting? Uh, all, it's, it's a little time late. Uh, it's, getting a result is very late compared to the darker ones. Oh. Have you come across with, uh, uh, is it uh, this uh, particular tool is available? Is it good for those who are foreign colors, foreign people color and Indian scenario? Uh, actually, uh, when the colors which is coming similarity to hand, 
uh, it's small difficulty to detect, uh, detect that thing. But uh, oh, that's why we used blob, uh, selecting the larger blob. Large blob may be the close to uh, the camera, which is when my hand is close to the camera, the other things behind me is very far from the camera. So that it will be less uh, smaller when, while we're taking a picture. So that's the reason why we're taking the largest blob. Okay, um, yeah. if uh, we have a larger blob, when we are showing two hands. Ah, in two hands, so we're selecting because the two largest Because two are standing blob. independent there. Really that two hands are standing independent. Yeah, yeah. That's so how you have done that combination? That is what I'm telling that uh, that uh, two hand detection, we selecting two blobs, largest to two blobs, we are selecting in two hand detection. In uh, one hand detection, we only selecting the main largest one. And uh, two hand detection, the second one is selected. Okay, second so all the things are done using tools. Or yeah. are you introducing any additional feature for having that uh, Actually, uh, red color and the blue color at the tip of the uh, uh, finger and uh, in between you have introduced um, blue. Yeah. Have you done any uh, measure for introducing that blue in between the fingers? No, we only have done the RGB range. Okay. Thank Next, I call upon paper ID 43 to present e-quarantine remote real-time monitoring of COVID-19 patients. Please note it's a 10 minutes presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am Amida Matthew, Assistant Professor, Department of Computer Science and Engineering, ASER itself. And uh, this paper, Eat Quarantine, Remote Real Time Monitoring of COVID 19 Patients. This was authored by uh, Vijay Vinod, Tom K. Thomas, Tony K. Jos, Mushin Ahmad Fasal, and uh, myself. And as they couldn't uh, join today uh, because of some issues, I am presenting on their behalf. And the contents are introduction, objective, methodology, results, future scope, and conclusion. And uh, e-quarantine is actually uh, intended uh, for monitoring the patients which are, uh, uh, which are quarantined uh, at homes. And nowadays we know the intensity of COVID is increasing and more patients are residing at home itself. But if the, uh, uh, if the, uh, risk level is increasing uh, in some cases it, it may not be we may not be able to monitor them properly so we have introduced this system uh, to monitor them uh, from the home itself and if the risk level is increasing we can uh, shift them to hospital and it determines the present health condition of the patient and analyzes the risk of the patient and categorizes the risk and alerts the officials in case of high risk and if the patient stays, stays at low, low risk for a period uh, of about say two to three weeks or depending how the authorities are telling, the patient can be discharged from our system with the approval from the medical staff. And when the condition of the patient worsens, the system will notify the nearest hospital about the situation and the ambulance services uh, can be sent immediately to shift the patient to the hospital. And in the actual implementation of the system, sensors can be assembled and set up by the health workers at the home uh, for observing the patient uh, so that the patient can detach and uh, attach the sensors on their own whenever required. Uh, and But for now, the data used for processing is not directly from the sensors, uh, but we are using uh, some data from existing databases. And the methodology utilizes the LSCM model, which is a recurrent neural network. And it helps to avoid the overcrowding in hospitals, thereby avoiding the spreading of virus. And it predicts the risk level of COVID-19 patients under home quarantine. And it saves the hospital resources for the most needed patients. And it helps the policymakers uh, to foresee the future requirements in the hospitals, reduce the chance of spreading of the disease by remote monitoring, 
the whole system can be reused in future for some other pandemic or similar situations also. And the methodology is since the coronavirus is uh, largely an illness affected for to lungs and the respiratory system, uh, we uh, follow uh, the method to predict the presence or absence of cardio cardiovascular disease and respiratory disease by using two different LSTM models. And we are uh, having a web interface also uh, for predicting. And in the cardio model, the first model is the cardio model. And the cardio model, uh, we are using the data set, uh, cardiovascular data set, which includes 70,000 records of different patients. And uh, during pre-processing, we have removed all the outliers and erroneous values and added some features called, such as a BMI, which is the body mass index from the already existing features available in the data set. And uh, normalize uh, the data set using min-max scalar also. And it preserves, this min-max scalar preserves the shape of the original distribution and it doesn't change the information embedded in the original data. And we have used 70% of the data for training and 30% for validation. And in the cardio model, uh, we have used different features such as uh, objective feature, which are called as the factual information, such as age, height, uh, weight, gender, et cetera. Then examination features, that is, uh, which are the results of some medical examination, uh, which, uh, such as systolic blood pressure, diastolic blood pressure, cholesterol, glucose, et cetera. Then some subjective informations, uh, which are given by the patient, such as uh, their smoking habits, uh, alcohol intake, physical activity, et cetera. And uh, we are using the ca uh, ca uh, cardiovascular uh, data set also. And in the ca cardio model, uh, it is implemented using TensorFlow and Keras. And uh, in the model, we had uh, two LSTM layers and two dense layers and added a single dropout layer to prevent overfitting. And uh, this, uh, this model was trained for 33 op epochs and a batch size of 32. And uh, we used the Adam optimizer and the accuracy was uh, close to 73 percentage. And in the respiratory model, we use the data set uh, the, from the Kegel. And uh, it consists of 920 respirator, respiratory audio recordings of length varying between 10 seconds to 90 seconds. And uh, we extracted the features like RMS, uh, RMSC, root mean square energy, then chroma shift, zero crossing rate, MFCC, spectral centroid, spectral roll-off, et cetera, from the audios and save their values in a CSV file. And uh, these are the different features extracted. That is the zero crossing rate, spectral roll-off, MFCC, uh, RMSC, and the spectral centroid. And in the uh, respiratory model, uh, it also consists of two LSTM layers and two dense layers. And this has been trained for 190 epochs and the batch size was uh, 32. And here also we use Adam optimizer and here the accuracy was close to 79 percentage. And in the results, uh, the patients were classified into different risk levels with the output from the LSTM model and considering the current symptom, symptoms which were asked directly to the patients through some through web application. And the different risk levels were class, uh, are uh, extremely high risk, high risk, medium risk and low risk. And the accuracy we uh, obtained are like four minutes. Okay, for cardio model, uh, for 33 epochs, we got the app accuracy of about 73 percentage. And for respiratory model, uh, for 190 epochs, the accuracy was 79 percentage. And uh, as a future scope, actually, I, as, uh, as I told earlier, we are not using the values directly from the sensors. That is, we are not using the real-time values. So by incorporating different IoT sensors for real-time monitoring, we can uh, expand this uh, project and uh, we can improve the training accuracy. Here we are getting only 73 and 79 percentage accuracy. Um, and this training accuracy can be improved uh, by using uh, more training data. And uh, I'm concluding, uh, e-quarantine system is intended for monitoring COVID positive patients remotely with the aim to reduce the spread of disease uh, and save hospital resources for high risk patients. And our system predicts the risk level of patients having COVID-19 and classify the patients based on their risk level. The decision and monitoring are very quick, so as any change in the risk level will be monitored easily. Thank you.
have you used uh, activation function? Which activation function you have used here? Uh, uh, ReLU activation function for it. Is it any particular by using that? Uh, Why you are using ReLU here? Uh, normally for LSTM, we are using a ReLU activation function. And it, any pooling you have done here for no. reducing or uh, um, shortening the feature size? No. No, no. no. Have you uh, tried out with the um, uh, skipping of a certain uh, features that you have listed? I think 12 features you have listed here. Yeah. Uh -huh. Have you tried out with the, the combination of a less number no. that, that gives you the approximate result? No, no. We you can try out with that. Okay, okay. That uh, which one is more prominent to lead to your um, uh, result? Okay, 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 okay. Okay. Thank you.